All right, welcome to the Art Casters. I think we're on episode 139. Am I right on that, Scott? It's yep. 139. So, as far uh, as you know. Yeah, so this is the art show where we do it weekly. It alternates between Scott Circlin and myself's channel, and we basically talk about cartooning, the ins and outs of illustration and graphic design. Um, pretty much everybody we have on here, including ourselves, are professional illustrators and cartoonists, and uh, we like to talk shop and kind of just talk a little bit about art and stuff. So we have a rotating third guest, and uh, today we're fortunate enough to be joined by Vincent DePorter um, for his second time on the show. And uh, before I get into this topic, I'll just do a little round with everybody, and we can kind of let everybody know where to find us. You're on my channel, so you know where to find um, my stuff. Um, and, you know, subscribe if you haven't. Also subscribe to Scott's channel so that, you know, when the show's going, you can kind of keep track of, like, which, which channel it's on. Um, and then, Scott, where can we find your work? Uh, yeah, you can find me at CircWorks pretty much most places online. Um, the places that I'm most prevalent our YouTube and I just I just uploaded a video today where I kind of went through and read some of my old rejection letters, so that was kind of fun. And I just talked about uh, rejection and kind of how to deal with it and everything. Um, I'm also on YouTube or um, Instagram, and I think tomorrow I should have a new video on IGTV as well. And then uh, to a lesser extent, I'm on Facebook and Twitter. Nice. Um... Yeah, and you guys should definitely check out that video. Also, check out the crossover with Corey Curry. Oh, yeah, that was awesome. To be honest, yeah. hilarious. That was and, awesome hanging out with Corey. So. Um, and the interview about uh, about uh, conventions is great, too. So, yeah, yeah. definitely go check that out. Yeah, um, that one's on Corey's channel. But, yeah. yeah. And if you go to my video, I've got links to a couple of Corey's videos at the end of those. So, Awesome. Um, and then Vincent... Uh, where can we find you other than in our comic shops? It, like, I mean, you've done a million uh, properties. You've done SpongeBob for a really long period of time. You did Scooby Doo. You do your own personal properties. You kind of have syndicated comics in multiple countries. And so, um, yeah, I mean, wh wh where can we find you other than in our comic shops? <laughs> Well, uh, usually you can find me on, um, I don't have a website really anymore. I do have a website, but it's a, a WordPress website where I do absolutely nothing. So I guess to get everything really uh, to see me on a regular basis, I'm on Facebook mostly, uh, close second Twitter, and I have uh, Instagram too, which uh, once in a while I'll just uh, flood with new drawings and stuff. Uh, so um, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and Facebook are the really the, the regular things I, I use. Perfect. Um, all right, so for this week's topic, um, Vincent actually brought this up, and, and the second he mentioned it, we were just like, oh yeah, this is a great topic. Um, Vincent, you wanted to kind of talk about sort of some of the differences between European and American comics, and part of, like, the second that was even brought up, it just um, brought up a lot of curiosity for me, because I think um, I'm, I'm guessing there's going to be really interesting things to, that that I don't know because I really don't. I'm not that familiar with a lot of European comics and uh, or that industry. And so um, I, I just it sounds like a really fascinating topic. So I, I I'm guessing that like a lot of this we're just going to be asking you a lot of questions. <laughs> no problem. Um, because of the fact that like. It, it's a really interesting topic. I haven't really, I haven't really delved into it that much. Um, I know my own experience with European comics has been mostly through uh, republications that are through like NBM or mm -hmm. Fanographics or like Drawn and Quarterly, where they'll like re-release. Um, but other than that, like I, I don't have a, a vast knowledge of like the publishers, like that mm -hmm. industry, and so. Um, yeah, so it's just sounds like a really fascinating topic. So, um, so you were saying that there are kind of some kind of key fundamental differences. Yes, uh, I, I would put it in three in three categories. Okay. Uh, the way we do art itself, the way we we draw a page. Uh, there's uh, the word editor has a different meaning in France than it does here. 
Um, and uh, the third thing is, uh, well, there's the format of the, 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 the publication itself, which usually is in hardcover. So it's more expensive. It's uh, collectible more. I, I mean, we collect comic books, but they're still flimsy things. You know, uh, we're talking about books you put in your library. Um, and then the other thing, the other difference is uh, how they treat uh, artists, writers, and um, what they call scenario, scenarista, scenario, scenario writers, and then uh, the uh, cartoonist. Uh, so the way, so there's the three things, the art, the publication side, and then the uh, promotional side and how they treat us. Got it. Okay. So I guess we could start with kind of like the, the art. Mm -hmm. um, that that would be a good place to kick it off. Um, my my perception from it, and this is just as a layman who hasn't has only read a little bit. It seems like with independent comics in the U.S. might have more in common yeah. with um, with European comics and mm -hmm. in the sense of like the process of creation more than I think like a Marvel book or a mm -hmm. DC book, yeah. um, but. But maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> so no, no. The reason uh, yeah. you're right, uh, where you're right, is that uh, you're talking about independent uh, artists and, and storytellers uh, that uh, may eventually become movies or, or series like uh, Walking Dead. But um, in general, yes, the independent comic book industry in the United States is a lot more like like the European style in the sense that it's. Uh, uh, what we call graphic novels, you know, that seems to be a pishaw kind of word. <laughs> but the truth is a graphic novel is uh, something that's more than a 20-page comic book. So uh, once uh, four comic books uh, become uh, one, uh, uh, how do you call it, compilation, that becomes actually a graphic novel, you know. So the graphic novel means something, and I think some people kind of get confused by it. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Mm. Um, it, it's funny, too, because I know a lot of cartoonists that aren't fond of the word graphic novel. Mm. And so uh, our, our our good friend who actually used to do this show with us, he he, all, he, he opted to call them chubbies <laughs> <laughs> yeah. because there's floppies, right? Yeah. And no, then, no, I, I love the I love the word graphic novel because like yeah. because being French, I think it has more prestige to it. <laughs> I yeah. think that you know I like words that have more prestige. You know, if you're going to call me, you know, um, uh, you know, a land surveyor, which was my first job ever. If you call me a land surveyor, but you prefer calling me a measurer, <laughs> you know, I say fuck that. It's a it's it's called a land surveyor. It's called a graphic novel when it's yeah. more than a comic book. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if it's the same size uh, in format than comic books. Once it's compiled, it's a damn graphic novel. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I think, to me, I, I mean, I don't mind the term graphic novel, but mm -hmm. I think when that term became popularized, at least in the States, it, yeah. seemed like it seemed like it kind of demeaned comics. Like comics weren't, you know, like comics are the, like the kid stuff, but graphic novel is the serious stuff. But... I don't mm -hmm. know. I like. No, I, I get that. I get that. I just don't. Uh, I just don't uh, reject it. That's all. But yeah. I, I get what you mean. Uh, I still do comic books. I, when somebody asks me what my job is, I say I'm a comic book artist. Yeah. Uh, in French, I say uh, "je suis un dessinateur de bande dessinée," which means I'm a I'm an artist of comic novels. If you oh, want. Yeah. Uh, so already uh, there's that that little bit of a difference where. Um, and, and you'll understand after we talk about how we are treated in France, for, for example, Belgium, of course, Switzerland, uh, Denmark, all those places. Um, in Europe in general, uh, we are treated like kings. Yeah, that's what I hear. Yeah. That's what I hear. Yeah. I'll talk about it later, but you'll, you'll be surprised by how they treat me. Even from here, when I have to go to Denmark, everything is paid for. And I mean everything. Huh. And then you get money when you, when you work there. So, you know, it's totally different. Here you go to the Comic Con. I can't even go to San Diego because I can never get in time to get a ticket. Why would you leave? No. <laughs> well, and, and anyways, uh, to be honest with you, I'm not. Uh, I don't fight to get to San Diego. Uh, I already think that Arizona Comic Con is becoming a ridiculous uh, thing. I'm not a fan, but that's me. You know, right. uh, because I'm a, an artist and I'm not a fan. Maybe that's why. I guess I'm a fan of the the. Uh, how do you say this? I'm a big fan of the. Um, of the craft, not so much of everything that's around it. Right, right. Which yeah, is more cinema. Yeah. 
I, I kind of can see both ways with the graphic mm -hmm. novel. I, I think uh, some of the people I know who, who are turned off by the term just don't like the fact that it has the word graphic in it. You know, it makes it almost sound like porn. <laughs> Is it, um, is it because they don't do graphic novels? Is yeah, that that's a good point. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> right. Um, believe but, me, I don't know one artist that does a graphic novel that will not say I just did a graphic novel. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. I use the word graphic novel all the time. Yeah. I think it's helpful. To, yeah. and, and I think that there have been a lot of like librarians and, um, and cartoonists in the U.S. who've been doing a lot of hard work to kind of try to change the mm -hmm. perception of comics and start getting like graphic novels pushed into bookstores. Mm -hmm because that's been happening in Europe for so long yeah. that I, I feel like that that's a word I got to embrace because I mean, that definitely is something that now is in culture. So yes. You know what that is, which is. And, and the regular Joe, that's not a comic book fan. He'll go to a book and he will have no problem saying, I want a graphic novel. Exactly. Uh, yeah. But to say a comic book, if he's 40 years old, I, uh, this being said, the 40 year olds are probably the, the main public of comic books, but um, it's just that, uh, uh, honestly, between you and me, it doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, totally. It's just that I don't see the problem with having a more prestigious uh, label that would make more people interested in comics because sure. it's not all comic book graphic. That's all. Otherwise, I don't care. You can call it doobity blue, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So, so so you were saying, so there's, there's a difference in the treatment, and mm -hmm. we're going to get into that a little bit later. Um, what about just kind of the approach? So you're, you're kind of talking about graphic novels are kind of it, it. So you're saying that's that's kind of is that more common in Europe, like the graphic novel itself? Or? Well, yes, uh, you do have the joke books, right, where it's one page, one joke, but it'll still be compiled in a 44 pager. Uh, so it will still look like a graphic novel. It won't in your collection. You'll have all the same sizes and stuff more or less thick, but you'll have, it's all the same size, right? So it's beautiful in your, your books, your bookcase, uh, which is a little bit the goal is to make something collectible and showable, you know, uh -huh. where you can show your collection. I was very proud of my collection when I had it. Now it's all in France. I, I don't have it anymore. But uh, um, the approach starts with how we draw and how we write. First of all, uh, script wise, it's pretty much the same. When I get a script from Scooby-Doo or a script from France, Pretty much it's the same, except that in France, they will usually do the Gossini way, which is on one page, you'll have a separation in the middle. You'll have the action on one side and the dialogues on the other. Huh. Like that this, in the is the, this is the script or the actual book? Yeah. So it, it's it, already you have like the novel kind of issue uh -huh. of it. Uh, this being said, um, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a writer myself, but uh, in the past years, it has become, thankfully, uh, more easy to just do a rough layout of the page and then balloons and then, you know, on a, if you can't do a nice writing, you'll write it on another page of the dialogue. But uh, otherwise, uh, you pretty much uh, have uh, just a list of uh, every uh, panel in that case and, and, uh, and um, the layout. Uh, drawing really badly if it's the writer who does it and doesn't know how to draw and it doesn't matter. It's just a layout, you know? Yeah. Uh, now, about the layout, uh, in, in, in comic books, they're smaller than the European version, right? So the European, European version, the editors uh, really count on you to do, the stencil should be four strips per page. Doesn't mean that there's going to be four, there's going to be splash pages and different things, but the, the format is four strips per page. Huh, okay. And in America, it's three. I have two stencils. I have one for uh, for comic books here, and I have one for the Europe. The European is larger, and it has four. So there's a lot more work. There's almost, I'd say, at least uh, thirty percent, thirty to forty percent more work on a European page than there is in the, in the American page, because it's going to require a lot more panels per page. Yeah, uh, you you have yeah, you have more panels per page. Uh, I wish I I could show. Yeah, I can show you. If you give me a second. Yeah, no problem. So that's interesting. I didn't even know there was a mass difference in the in the paneling in the script. <laughs> this is already pretty interesting. Yeah, I um, didn't I didn't know that either. It seems like the the one thing I remember is so it's, this, oh, uh, this is my more cartoony uh, book. As you can see, it's a hardcover, right? Got a nice mm -hmm. little, you know, got a nice shine to it and everything. 
But inside, you'll see, even though this, these are jokes. This is one page per joke, OK? okay. But you'll see it's four. Oh, OK. Yeah. Got it. OK? So there's more work on um, on a European book than there is. On, on, like for three pages of SpongeBob, it would take uh, only two pages in France. Hmm. All right? Got it. So that's for the uh, layout. So that's a big difference because, of course, you don't get paid more page in France for what you do, right? But you have more work on it. Um, then there's the uh, drawing itself. The drawing, uh, and it was funny when I came in America, I was like blown away that you guys would put the balloons after the art. I say, well, then you're drawing a bunch of art for nothing. Like you're doing this beautiful building and you're going to slap a, a bubble on there. Yeah, so but you, you have to be that. pretty sure that you're not going to be changing a bunch of dialogue. If you're gonna, yes, if you're gonna put yeah, but, the, yeah, but the, it doesn't matter because if you, uh, uh, I've had no, I, I've been translated in at least 10 languages. Uh -huh. I have comic books here. I've always done my balloons first, but you put the, the lettering on a, on a different page. Not, not anymore. You just put it on a different layer. But you do your lettering first because then you know how much space you have left to do your drawing. I never got it that you right, would have right. this beautiful Gotham City background and you'd have a, a, a freaking uh, balloon that is slapped on it, which in any case doesn't change because when they do the translation, they don't change the balloon, they just change the text inside. Yeah. And you can tell. But, but some languages, it takes more words to tell yes, the same. They just shrink the, the lettering. I've seen it over and over again. American comic books where the balloon has not changed places, so the whole idea of it being. Right, you know, because right. we want to change places, is not taken into consideration. And they just adapt the, the lettering and, and the thing to the translation to the balloon. Yeah. It, it just doesn't make sense. So um, I, I thought that was ridiculous. So when I, I first met um, David Irwin, my first editor of my and my good friend uh, since then, he decided everything Batman at the time in DC Comics. Uh, he would say, so what do you do? Lettering? Do you do a penciling, inks, or color? I said, what do you mean? I do everything. We do everything. You know, we also flush our own toilets. You know, that's that's how we do it here in, in, in Europe. You know, so he said, wow, you're a triple. He called me the triple threat because my lettering was good. And, you know, so. Uh, uh, so, yeah. So in France, the, the logic is I say France, but I mean Europe. The logic is you do the balloon work first like that. You don't draw for nothing. You're not going right. to draw a beautiful city in the background where a big balloon's going to be. Yeah. So, yeah. you know. You, you do the balloon first, you do, I mean, you do the lettering, you do the balloon, you do the whole thing, you do the inking of the, uh, the, the even the, um, the panels, everything, without the drawing. And then you go to the drawing and you don't waste your time. Right. Okay. Yeah. And I, I do know some, uh, some American artists that do it that way because yeah. of those very reasons. And I, I'm just wondering, like, as far as the sale of original art, now some people may prefer to only just have the artwork. I've never encountered um, that. Yeah, but I mean, I, I know, like, when I when I look at pages, especially back when they were, when everything was traditional and the lettering was, lettering was traditional, and you see all, all the paste-ups and everything, mm -hmm. I mean, to me, that's really cool. So to yeah. have everything there, you know, I guess it's like, I guess it's just what you prefer, because when you do get, like, original art with the way we do it over here, you don't know the story other than, well, hopefully you yeah. can tell what yeah. the story is if it's, if it's, if the story's, Told well enough, you could tell without the words, but still, yeah. So even I mean, better, you get a very messy page. You know, yeah. I, 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 you get messy pages because uh, uh, this work is not done by the artist; it's done by the uh, people upstairs that do right, the uh, right. production. The production. That, actually, I would say that having a, a page that's hand lettered and mm -hmm. has has like a segment of the actual text of the story on it, to me, just ups the perceived value. Oh yeah, me too. Like, you know uh, what I've, I've been always asked every time I do a thing because I do my lettering myself. I I, I I I did years of you know lettering my stuff, and I've always been asked, "Do you do your own lettering?" Because the lettering, I sometimes get more compliments for the lettering than I do for my drawings. Uh, so for me, and this will be my personal final word on that, the lettering is part of the art. Yep, oh, yeah. that's I all there is to it. So now I, today. I, I, yeah. I was just going to ask Josh, do you do it like Vincent's talking about? Yeah. So yeah, like the I, first yeah. thing I map out, um, like I do a thumbnail of the page and stuff, so I kind of have a rough idea. Um, but the first thing I map out before anything is the panel borders and the balloons, like mm -hmm. the text and all of it, so that I know what space I have to work with. 
because and and I had to learn this the hard way. I, I went through a full graphic novel where I didn't do that, and I did catch myself having to edit out like half of what I drew. So it seemed That's like right. a That's big right. waste of time. Mm -hmm. And then not just that, but like there's something about um, like to me, I, because I do everything traditionally, there's something about having a, an asset on there that's digital mm -hmm. that didn't blend well. And so for, for multiple reasons, that's why I've started kind of hand lettering and, and adding balloons and doing everything by hand because it just kind of blends it all together. If you look at my if you look at my uh, portfolio, you probably have my link to you, or do you want me to put it there? Yeah, yeah, we have it. From yeah, us. you um, you saw that Romeo character. Yeah, yeah. You have to admit those those strips would not look the same if it was digital lettering. No, no but I yet. do digital lettering now. I, of course, I I did my own uh, lettering that you see in Romeo. I did those, but they don't look as artistic because it's even though it's my writing, it's still done digitally now. Yeah, uh, here uh, for my. For me that, I think I did digitally. I think, yes, I did. See, but it still looks okay. I mean, it's just not as. I'll try to get a close up. It's still not as artistic as Romeo. Yeah, I love your lettering. That's good. But it is my lettering at least. Yeah. But uh, it's uh, digital now. Um, so, so that's one of the big things I think that uh, surprised me when I first came here, and I learned with uh, SpongeBob and Scooby Doo. That uh, often the balloons would just uh, be pasted where I did, you know, some effort in drawing. So, um, fortunately, even uh, sometimes I get to do a SpongeBob. I've done some of it, my own lettering, but usually they have to give it to somebody because or else it looks like I'm just taking everything for myself, right? Yeah. So uh, that's another thing: is that you're considered to be kind of a, a piece of shit if you take all the work to yourself, the colors and everything. So, because uh, there's work for everybody, so it's different spirit. In France, doing comic books is a—it's like doing a painting, uh, you know, a Picasso. It's like yeah. you have to do everything, or it's not worth anything. And fair enough, when I sell my 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 pages, well, I work more digitally now. But when I sold my pages in Denmark, I kept them specifically for Europe because I know that instead of twenty-five dollars a page, I'd get two hundred and fifty. Yeah, you know, oh, that makes perfect sense. Because it's more worth it. If it's a, if it's a, it's like those paintings, you know, those cheap paintings you buy where somebody does the blue, somebody does the sky, somebody does the little mountain, and somebody does the little boat. You know, the the you know what we call cheap paintings that you find in dollar stores, but it's because they're done in, in chain and they have they don't have any specific artistic value. Yeah, I I see. I would agree with this entirely too because. I don't want to sound pedantic either. I don't want to sound like I I, I, I think comic uh, book is better than being a surgeon. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. It, you don't sound like you're. It, it doesn't sound like you're saying that like by doing it as a team, you're somehow copping out or something. Yeah, no, no, you're but, not. It's just that you're doing it as a team. You know, it's uh, it, unlike a band like music that we both, uh, all three of us do. All, instead of music, music it has more value by doing it as a team, but. In a comic book, when uh, you know when you're selling a page uh, or you're signing an autograph, and people say, "So did you do all this?" and you say, "Well, I just did this and I did that," it's it's kind of maybe it's my uh, my 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 I started my career in Europe. Maybe it makes me feel a little bit uh, lesser. I don't know, but I, I like to be able to show a page. Did you do this? Yes. Yeah, I, I can tell that. Um, I can say the same thing for like. Uh, back when I was doing freelance or whatever, and mm -hmm. I showed my portfolio, even there were projects where I worked on with other people, I wouldn't really show that stuff. I would only show the stuff where I did everything. Yes. And people would ask you, and they'd kind of be surprised, like, wait, you did this and this? Or what part of it? The, they'll ask, what part mm -hmm. of this did you did, did you do? And I said, well, I did it all. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to show it in my portfolio unless I did all of it. So, right, right, right. Yeah. Agreed. Or you show uh, in your portfolio uh, a part that is just, you know, collaboration. Right. Right. Uh, like in my portfolio, it's a, it's a downloadable one, a printable one for those who want. But it's uh, it does have part uh, collaboration and part. But I say when it's like if I just did the inks, I'll say I just did the inks on this. You know. Yeah. Uh, because I hate to be asked a question. I, I it hurts my ego. Yeah. I, I don't want to be asked. I want to be upfront about it. Oh, that's wonderful! What a great drawing. Well, as you can see, it says in big inking. <laughs> it's like uh -huh. I didn't do it, you know. Like that DC uh, thing I did with uh, with the Nightwing, 
that was my inking only and that's why i put on big inking i don't want to i don't want to pretend i i don't want to get credit for what i didn't do yeah no that makes perfect sense but i still show it i just i just make it clear that it's not me that I, I love it i i think um it's it, once again there's an overlap between kind of indie mm -hmm. uh comics and and yeah. and european because like for instance like my, my favorite art i'm actually wearing a Chris Ware shirt right now, but mm -hmm. Chris Ware is one of my favorite artists. I wouldn't be half as blown away with Chris Ware if it weren't for the fact that he does mm -hmm. his own lettering, he does mm -hmm. his own colors, he does everything. And story from the ground up, like half of the time, even the printing, like yeah, most yeah. of it is, yeah. it's all author control. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, same with like, you look at something by Robert Crumb, it's like mm -hmm. the whole thing is his, not- Well, the big advantage financially for them too, for uh, for an artist that does it all by himself, is that if it turns out to be a movie or a series, mm -hmm. you really get everything you know for yourself. Now, I'm not saying you have to be greedy about it. I'm just saying that you get the credit and you get the money for it, you know? Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Uh, yeah. Um, but I like your shirt, Josh, but I, I prefer mine, which is an original Joshua Kimball. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, there you go. I use it. <laughs> um, yeah. I like it. Uh, yeah, I, I. I'd wear that. I, He's got I, them on sale on his website. That's true. You guys I'll can go out. check them out. At you can either get them at Society Six or at Threadless. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, I I tend to like stuff that's completely done by the author. Mm -hmm. I mean, like that's one of the things that even like Scott and I first clicked on is the fact that we're both creating these, you know, right. personal project comics that are completely created by us, you know? You know, and I'm yeah, I totally get it. I think that's a different, I don't know. It's like a different vibe of cartoonists. Like when I go to the NCS there, even though every cartoonist there, even the ones who work for Marvel or DC, most of them are working on personal projects where they do everything. Yeah. And uh, that's usually what their what their heart is attached to, you know. <laughs> well, you have to you have to pay the bills, and then you have to do your thing. Which doesn't mean like I'll tell you something for SpongeBob. Mm -hmm. uh, I met my ed the editor, the main man for Nickelodeon magazine at the time, Chris Duffy, and we quickly became friends. I showed him my portfolio in '98 or '97, and he I wasn't even back home from the train in Brooklyn, where he had already called my wife and told me to come right back to MTV and Nickelodeon. And he hired me on the spot to do the Rugrats. Like, it took less than three hours. That's awesome. Um, we became friends since then, great friends. And then when Nickelodeon magazine shut its pages, he was the first one to call me and say, look, uh, Hillenberg is doing the comic book. Are you in? Like, you know, chuckle. You know? And I said, of course. The good thing I like about Chris Duffy is he does have a very European way of working, even though he's a typical American uh, editor. He um, he wants us to write, draw, you know, and eventually sometimes color our own stories. That's why I got to be the author of my own drawings often. Um, in in uh, I had like really a few, I had a few issues where I did the whole issue and I was really thrilled, you know, like really thrilled. Yeah. I got, um, and I got to do everything, you know, and he would be, he's a great editor. He would see the issues, and, but we never had a lot, to, a lot. I never had a lot to change. I mean, he, I've been working with him for almost 20 years. So of course, you know, we get to know each other. I draw and I say, well, he won't like that. Okay. But he's always very, uh, courteous and, and friendly. And he's, he, he, he can't wait for me to get back on, on the SpongeBob train as soon as it's uh, possible. Uh, we just don't know what the uh, coming book is going to, if it's going to continue or not. The problem with Chris is that he, uh, I think that he, such a great, passionate man that he probably has a backlog. He probably took a lot of stories, even some that I did that haven't been printed yet. So yeah, you'll still see my stuff in the coming book. But um, it's uh, holy shit! I just realized I had to send him something today. Oh no. I'll do it tonight. Uh, anyway, uh, there we go. Uh, silly me. But anyways, yeah, uh, it's it, it's so you do have a lot of editors that uh, are passionate. Like uh, one of the editors at DC, which was for Paradox Press, where I did the big books with him. Um, 
Helfer, Andy Helfer. His favorite comic book of all times, which is basically mine too, is Tintin. So good. And it was his favorite of all times. And so when we met and I started doing the big books with him, we, we got really chummy really fast. Um, but um, so, yeah, we, so about the art, I think that's about it. I mean, you know, uh, right now I'm doing everything from layout to colors on this album I'm doing for, we call them albums there. <laughs> um, we don't call them books or anything. We just call them albums. Did you do huh. a new album? Yeah. So this is in, in, in European speak. This is an album. Uh, it, you, it, don't, you don't say graphic novel. You don't say comic book. You yeah. say album. Yeah. Would that, so is that the first thing that would be produced? Or is that like a collection? Like Well, this I, I have two two in this series of uh, Les Formidables. Uh -huh. And then uh, it kind of slowed down. I, I had new writers for the uh, second book. And this one won an award. This one won an award in Switzerland. And I did everything on this one. And then uh, I decided to take some writers for the second one, and uh, it kind of fizzled out. Right. I think but, they did a great job personally, but they, it, it just the public didn't. Do they do they exist as like floppies first before they go hardcover, or do they yeah. come out originally as yeah. hardcovers? Uh, ironically, it's the other way around. Oh, like okay. I, I have, well, I have floppies. It's typical with like pros. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you, know, you get a hardcover, and then right, right, right. It's kind yeah. of weird that it's backwards with American. Comics. It's totally more like uh, American novels, right? Uh, yeah. Hardcover, yeah. and then you'll have the uh, soft cover. And uh, in my case, I have a lot of soft covers, but that are translated backwards in Arabian or, mm. or you know, I have Chinese. Uh, I have all kinds of translations of my books. So they're funny when you see them translated. Uh, but by the way, the balloons don't change. It's just the wording that changes. Mm. So th it's not really a problem. You're not going to change the dialogue so much that you're going to have to change the balloon. Rhythm. Right, because I guess you could equate that to when you do a dub from like an anime. Yeah. I mean, you've got to figure out how to fit fit it to whatever they're saying so right. they match up a little bit. So I assume yeah. you can do the same with, yeah. And, that, and, I guess and, I never and you don't translate word by word. You don't translate the word. You translate right. the spirit of the phrase. Right, right. right. So, yeah, that makes perfect sense. So you change it as you want, as long as it's the spirit of the phrase is true. Um, if you do word by word, of course, you're going to have, like in French, you'll have too many words. Uh, if you translate from English or the other way around, you won't, you'll have like a big balloon with three words in it in English. You have to adapt, you know. Right. So that's part of I, I do some translating in French, English, uh, usually from English to French. No, from French to English. Uh, I did for Fluid Glacial and, and, and Icy Fluid, they say it here. Um, and some naughty comic books that I translated. And uh, so uh, it's fun because you get to, you know how I like words. That's why I debate a lot on, <laughs> on Twitter. I like, I like, uh, I like words. I like, uh, you know, so translating is always a fun thing for me. I, I would do it more if I had more time. Um, I, I am so fascinated. Like I, to me, just putting that kind of money into the printing, mm. what, you know, and making a beautiful kind of collectible mm. book. I see that happening more and more frequently with with books and comics in the U.S., but it it um it kind of bums me out that that's such a current thing. Like, why does that have to be a new thing here yeah. to do that well, with comics? Like, it it it's so um it's a culture thing. The first Tintins that came out in the twenties or thirties, they were already hardcover too. So so cool. It's always been hardcover. Uh, uh, I I personally like. I personally, this is me. Yeah. I personally like a smaller far, format. Yeah. Uh, and what I love most is a is a cardboard, a, a supple, a flexible cardboard cover with yeah. a flap. I I love when it it folds. And oh, it I know you, what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. And it gives you a little bit of a, a thickness on the sides. Yeah. Because it's it's, it's folded, right? And uh -huh. it's kind of cool, and it's easier to read than these because these I, I find them a little bit big, though. Yeah. I, I do. I think those are actually, aren't those called French folds? At least in the US. I think, uh, yeah. They exist in France too, but usually for smaller independent comics. Because then it's the other way around. When they do independent comics in France, they usually get printed like this. But uh, some of them don't like that and they get their own printed, you know, flaps. They so, like the flaps. one European comic I have, mm -hmm. it's one of my favorites. Are you familiar with Three Shadows? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Cyril yeah. Perdrosa. Yeah. 
So is that what you're talking about? This right yes, here? I yeah. love that for me. Yeah. Yeah. But this Baller. is just a beautiful book and beautiful, beautiful story. It's sad, but it's really, it's really, it's a beautiful story. It, it's wonderful. Yeah. But yeah, so and then you you know then the color is always you know uh, more expensive. But uh, if you're working for a big editor, I worked for Glenna, I worked for Spirou uh, Dupuis. Those are big editors. There's no question that they're going to sell your book the most beautifully possible. Um, so they'll always do hard covers, shiny and stuff. You know. That's, um, that's yeah. awesome. It's fun, but uh, it's always the grass is always green on the other side. When I was in France, I was craving to have a comic book, <laughs> a typical American comic book uh, published. So it's uh, it's the way we, we always find the the plus and the minuses. You know, more often when we're it's always the grass always greener usually. Oh yeah, it, for sure, for sure. I always in my head, I every time I meet a new cartoonist, I always convince myself mm -hmm. that that's the cartoonist who's mm -hmm. enjoying it more. Yeah. I'm like, you must be having a blast doing this because mm -hmm. it's it's got to be fun and easy for mm -hmm. someone, right? <laughs> yeah, and the the book I'm doing right now is since I'm doing also the colors, I get to really go it's going to be like in a funny, like a more uh, humor kind of comic book, but uh, more like what I do for Scooby-Doo. Uh -huh. But uh, uh, it's going to be so beautiful. And the thing is, I already know it's going to be out with a shiny hardcover and stuff. So it's it's, it's also encouraging yeah. uh, you to do better. You know, you kind of say, ah, I'm, I can't get away with this. It has to be nicer. So there's that. But um, in both uh, in both the continents, the, uh, there's advantages and, and disadvantages, you know. Um, but the comic books in France still still work better. There, it's it's more viable. Uh, so of course, since I've been uh, struggling here, I've been thinking, okay, I'm going to start doing a maybe the ants again or another story and just do it in French right away and just send it to editors. And then once they say yes, you know, you're going to get at least eleven thousand dollars worth of a. Uh, 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 what they call advance on royalties. So if they don't make the book, if the book doesn't work, you still get to keep that money. Nice. And if it works, they take it off your your benefits. You know, your so benefits. it's more of it's similar to the children's book uh, yeah. model here. Yeah, yeah, and they pay well. They pay about eight thousand dollars for a forty-four pager, uh, plus another uh, three thousand for the. Uh, for the story, because the story always gets paid less. But once the book is out, the writers and the um, in France, especially since Asterix, they agree to do 50-50 on the uh, royalties. And of course, the royalties will start getting paid more to the writer because he takes less money as advance on ro royalties. Ah. I'm giving a rough uh, figure. It changes, right, from editor right. to editor. But roughly, you get roughly $11,000 if you write and draw the story and so cover it. So this is something I've actually thought about. I, I don't, you know, we don't have to get like too heavy into this mm -hmm. uh, now, but like I've actually considered submitting to European publishers because yep. of the fact that when I was doing T-shirts and that was my main living, um, the magazines that I got featured in were all French. Mm -hmm. Like, so I would get these interviews and interview pages mm -hmm. and my art in like these books, but they were all like in Europe as like. This is a street artist, you know that yeah. kind of thing. I, I'm um, going to give a, I'm going to give a, 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 a tip to every cartoonist watching us here in America. If you want to make some money and if your stuff is good, go European. It'll, it'll come back translated in English, anyways. But you know, and you can do it in English. You don't have to worry too much about translator. You always find a translator to do it. But it's more money, or at least it's the same money, but it's all yours. And what's good about it is that the advance on royalties uh, are for you to keep. Whatever happens, you know. I love it. So, that sounds that sounds fascinating. I, I should actually look into that because I haven't you should, you um, yet. Anybody who's listening right now should you know, consider it. Yeah, but, I think uh, I think Josh, your comic in particular, I think it would because it is it's more personal. You know, it's, right, right. it seems like yeah. If it's more of. Um, I don't want to use the word soap opera, but you can do like a soap opera thing in comic books and sell very well in France and Europe in general. Um, but at the same time, if you're doing superheroes and stuff like that, then forget it. It's not going to sell anything in France. They don't give a crap about superheroes. And when they do, they do it via Marvel and DC. They don't care about it. Yeah. That's 
that makes sense. So I mean, men, you know, men in tights have never been you know listed as one of the interesting things for European readers. So I have a question. So when I was in France, I went into a comic store, and it was what drew me in was they had a giant uh, um, like great Mazinga. Yeah. You know, Shogun Warrior. But I went in and it was all it was all Japanese comics. Yeah. So is, it, they're how, big there. what's that? They're big there, yeah. Yeah, that's what I was gonna ask because mm -hmm. that, I expected to go in and find a European comics. And now when you know, when I was there, when I went to you know bookstores and stuff, that I they did comics did have a big presence over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, throughout Europe. It um, depends where you go, but um in Belgium or in France, you have typical comic books stores where you'll have all the French, European comic books. Mm -hmm. Then you'll have the American side and everything like that, but you always have a huge manga uh, presence. Yeah. You'll have always big, you know, Sailor Moon mm -hmm. you know, things. And yeah. That's that's what you'll get. And um, uh, that's one of the things I admire about Japanese cars. And I, I used to not be at all uh, much of a manga fan until I was introduced at the time by my editor in France to um, Dragon Ball, not Dragon Ball Z, but the first Dragon Ball. Yeah, yeah. And I had the whole collection and it was so adult. I was like, holy shit, there's sex in here. There's boobs. There's, you know, the old man, you know, <laughs> with the young girl. It's, it was totally a different culture for me. I remember thinking, and this is on TV. And then I realized on TV it was very much edited. But the, but the stories were amazing. I mean, it was just a culture shock for me, Dragon Ball. Yeah, we have, uh, there's a cartoonist named Chris McQuinlan who comes on here occasionally, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he mentioned Dragon Ball as a huge influence. And yeah, I had yeah. to clarify to our, our listeners just so that they wouldn't think we're talking about Dragon Ball Z or like the cartoon. Yeah. Dragon Ball, but yeah. We're talking about the comic Dragon Ball, which was, even the drawing was much better. It's yes, just, yes. It, it was really well done. It was politically incorrect. It had some oh, things that were morally terrible. questionable, <laughs> um, but uh, really morally questionable. I mean, we're oh, yeah. talking uh, serious crap there. But um, but that it wasn't. It was never the the core of the story. What the core of the story was always amazingly well done. And then I kind of dropped off, and then I went to see um, um, uh, my first uh, Japanese anime ever was Akira. I went to see it in, Jap in Japanese, but in Paris, and I was with um, the whole gang of my friends from the animation company I was working with, and we were like, wow. Yeah. How did they do that? And we were here, we're animators at the time, right? And we're like, I don't know how they did that. And uh, this was before the CGI stuff came out. So Akira was also a big uh, shock for me. I, I never really got into all the anime, I mean, I did like some, I, I, I do follow some once in a while. Um, my favorite one, I think, right now is probably still uh, Rania. You know, the girl that, uh, her, the, her father is a burglar and a steal, uh, he steals things. Uh, what's it? Rania, Ranja, or something like that, right? Huh. You know that, what I'm talking about? No, I'm not familiar. No, it's, I'm not, yeah, I'm not like. It's, it's great. It's on Hulu, I think. Oh, that's awesome. oh so it's a it's an anime, it's not a manga. No, or it's it an might anime. be both. But. It might be both. I don't know yeah. if there's a manga. It's called You should check it up uh, while we're talking, I'm gonna be looking. Uh it's um it's an incredible, incredible thing. But anyways, yeah, there's some really good ones. Um you know uh, the um what's it called? The black not the black book, but uh uh, what's it called? The dark, the black, the black books, or even the mangas are all black. Um, oh, um, uh, Death Note. Death, Death Note. Note. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I've seen, I actually, I've seen Death Note. That's yeah, one that, of the few animes yeah. that I've. That I've seen. was amazing. There's actually a live action. Yeah, I saw it. It's not too bad. People I, I watched. It. I watched the live action first, and I was like, I can see. I'm like, okay, I kind of, I kind of like this, but I can see why people wouldn't like this. Mm -hmm. but, oh, the, but 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 that's what. One? Yeah. Yeah, there's a live action. There's an actual Japanese uh, TV movie they made. Okay, it. but, but the, the Netflix one is actually what got me to watch the yeah, anime. Yeah, so I, I thought like, it was good. People yeah, didn't like it because they thought that he, uh, what's his name, was more like the Joker. He was funny, which is not the case in the manga or in the comic in the cartoon. 
I liked I liked that choice. I thought it was See, a good out of, choice. Out of all the things in that, I thought that the, the uh, what was I forgot yeah, the character's was, name, but I thought he was the most similar to the way he was in yeah, the, in the I, anime. I thought I thought he was great. I, I yeah. that, uh, everything else was like totally. And, and of like, course, I like all the Ghibli movies. Oh. Yeah, oh, there's, uh, yeah, I think Princess Monaki, uh, um, Spirited Away, even Ponyo was fantastic. I mean, th all those movies are fantastic, even the yeah. old ones. Yeah, actually, it's funny because I get criticized for liking Ponyo a lot. But oh, I Ponyo is great. I mean, you that's, know, that's the first I'm one like I saw. You. I took my daughter to I'm see like it. I like you. I for me, the first one was Totoro, right? Yeah, mine was I got great. That on DVD, and I still haven't seen it. <laughs> yeah, Totoro will always be in my heart, like the best one in my heart because it's the first one, right? Yeah, that makes. But sense. when I went to see Ponyo, and then I was criticized for liking Ponyo, I said, "You guys, you know what it is? You have Disney phobia. That's what. Yeah, you have. that's all you have." I hate Disney as a corporation. I love what Disney does when it comes to art. Yep. Now, this being said, people who don't like Ponyo, they always will say the same thing. Right after saying, uh, it's a Disney, he need Disney and Disney. And it's like, shut up. It was one of the best movies that year that came out. Yeah. It's one of the most beautiful stories. Mm -hmm. Well written. The animation is just it just it 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 just tears your heart. You know, it just yeah. I don't know, yeah, man. It's, it's so good, and it has a great theme song. Like, a oh, it does. Song. Yeah. Uh, but so uh, the first Ghibli film I ever saw was Grave of the Fireflies, which is like oh, yeah. an excellent movie. But it's one of those movies you're like depressed for like four weeks after watching. <laughs> I don't know if any so, of you guys knew was, about it or remember it because right? it's really old. Uh -huh. The first anime show that I saw in French in France was called Heidi. You know Heidi, the, the movie Heidi. But here it's uh, it was done by I think Ghibli or at least the first animators of that uh, that uh, that style, and it was like Little House on the Prairie, but in uh, in uh, anime form, and it was absolutely incredible. I mean, yeah. uh, okay, you're gonna laugh at me. I liked Little House on the Prairie. I was a big fan. Because it brought me back to my memories when I was uh, living in a garage uh, in the middle of Canada, where we had uh, just uh, we had a, a piss pot and we, oh, that's all we had, an outhouse that you wouldn't go in winter, and we had just lamp oil lamps. So when I saw the first little house on the it came out, it totally reminded me of my childhood. And then I, I always had a I always loved uh, Michael Landon, and so I, I love the series. But there's that little series Heidi. That's done. If you can find it, I, I I looked for it a while back and I couldn't find it, but I didn't look hard. If you can find Heidi, uh, that is just, uh, it's a beautiful, uh, simple, simple. You're yeah. just with her. It's like uh, the new, um, the new um, uh, Anne of Green Gables on, on Netflix, which is absolutely, mwah, it's just fantastic. I get a kick out of that. Nice. I haven't, I still haven't seen it. Um, but I'm, but I'd like to, because I, I did like the series from like I think it was like the early '90s. Like. Yeah, it was actually '80s, I think. Last, uh, yeah. maybe '90s. You might be right. But uh, the girl who plays um, Anne in this one, she's just oh my gosh, That's she, excellent. you'll fall in love with her. She's fantastic. That's cool. I love those stories. Uh, I, Me I too. So. Um, so um, okay. Uh, so that was to talk about anime, how anime can be like that, you know? Just, yeah, that's that makes doesn't have to be superhero and stuff. Yeah, so like, so the the genre differences are there. You were mentioning that there's like editorial differences too. Yes. So, yeah. so what's the editorial? What's like a big uh, difference between an the editor and... here will edit. He will get you draw back to the drawing board. He will tell you this is not good. It should be like this. He actually is the director of your art, right? Before it's published. In Europe, the editor and publisher is basically the same. If the editor slash publisher doesn't like what you do, you'll say no. If he likes what he'll do, he will let you do whatever you want to do. He might give you a hint if really something seems out of place to him. And he'll do it politely or he won't do it politely and say, I won't do the book altogether. But an editor in Europe is also the publisher. He's like, he, he, he'll look at it and he'll say, I like it. I mean, maybe this I don't, but it doesn't matter. That's your, that's your job. Yeah. We'll see what the public says later. Huh. Here in the States, the editor, usually they're pretty good at it. Uh, actually, you know what the public won't like. So your, your work is already a little bit diluted. You know what I mean? Yeah. For the commercial good, by the way, which I'm not against. 
But I do like the fact that in Europe, you do your thing, and even if you fuck up in the middle of the story, in, in, they publish it. It's up to the readers to see if they like it or not. Huh. I, I like That's that a, a big difference. <laughs> That's a huge difference. All right. So far, European comics seem to be winning, in my opinion. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> but, 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 you know, it's like I say, there's a give and take. Uh, uh, if you're up, like like my second uh, book of the Formidable didn't work, uh, maybe if I had an editor who said no, you know we have to do it like this, like this, like you did in your first book, it w it might have worked. So it's it's a give and take. But That's for the artist, idea. but for the artist, for his ego, <laughs> mm -hmm. for his creativity, it's fantastic to be able to give a book and to take it or leave it. Wow, that sounds excellent. But but I do know what you're saying with editing. Yeah. Um, I, like to me, I always think this is a good example of where editors can be good. Yeah. Um, and this might be kind of contentious to say, but like, I don't know if you guys have ever seen. Um, well, of course, you guys have seen Blade Runner. Oh so, yeah. <laughs> the original Blade Runner, and then the director's cut, to me, is a really good example of like editing gone right. Because you think so? I don't think so. I like the happy end of the first one. Yeah. Well, no, I do like the ending, but the narrative being mm -hmm. cut out. You liked it better? I like the first person narrative that's in it. Me too. Me too. That's, that's what I'm saying. I like the first one. Yeah. I like, I like the European cut with the happy ending. Yes. And the narration. Because I don't, I don't know how many people, and maybe it's just because it's the first one I saw, but I don't know how, how often you're going to get three people in a room that agree with that. But yeah. yeah well, I, well I, you I, just have two people who agree on that. Yeah. Uh, in I, the same I room. Like the editor made the oh, right I agree too. Call. Yeah, the three the editors people. made the right call to add that that first person narrative throughout the whole story. Yes, but then the editor's cut is without it. That's why I was confused. With the the, the director's, got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, I don't like the director's cut. No, I agree. I liked it with the narration, which exactly. the editors pushed uh, on Ridley, uh, Scott. Exactly. On him. I think they were right. They were right, I, I agree. Because uh, the whole part with the, the cop is totally lost on 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 without the narration. It's it's an un totally lost. It's, it's a very difficult to follow kind of yeah. less engaging story without that narrative, and I think it would have done less well in the box office too without that. So and sometimes like, yeah yeah I mean I th I can understand like there's different opinions and stuff, but I tend to think that's a good yeah, example of like an editor in gone right like in the, in the I, case think so. like, I think so I think that studios actually exactly, right. yeah yeah. yeah. Sometimes yeah. they're right. So it's, it's a give and take, you know? Yeah. Uh, really, Scott, rather, he wanted to have his director's cut and do it his way, fine. See, that's great for him. I didn't like it. Most people like it. I, I don't like it. I like the original um, Same here. release, yeah. right? And so, and I went to see it three times that week in 84, 1984, when it came out. That's how much I liked it. And it changed my, my views on other things that we've already talked about. Um, on my beliefs and stuff. It, it changed everything for me. Uh, just a side note, the new Blade Runner was fantastic. Oh, I, I still it. haven't seen it oh, yet. So it, it was so good. It was yeah. like, can you imagine, this is, Blade Runner, after The Sound of Music, I'm sorry, is my favorite movie. It is one it's, of the best. It's my, never, it's my second best. You almost have to see it in the theater, man, with the yeah, sound. Yeah, you have to, you have oh, to. But, but I saw it in IMAX, holy crap. I will yeah, tell man. you, I was so scared to be disappointed because Blade Runner is one of my favorite movies, yeah. and it was perfect. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to have to do it. Yeah, it's great. Right. Yeah, I've got it. I, don't, I very rarely, nowadays, I very, very rarely buy Blu-rays or DVDs, yeah. but that one I got. Yeah. So, yeah. That, one, that one was freaking nice. amazing. So you can do any kind of story. Oh, in France, too, you, have, you can do any kind of stories. Um, like, for example, sometimes you get blown away by, by a movie, and you want to do that kind of thing in comic books. You have to be careful. Like for me, this year's best movie for me was uh, *The Quiet Place*. Uh, it was the most original movie uh, this year, from my from my point of view. As much as I love the Marvel movies and I thought they were great, you always kind of expect what you're going to see. Uh, although I, I will say that um, I was kind of surprised by uh, by uh, *Infinity Wars*, but um, it was a good movie. But you know what you're going to get. When you go into the movie and you see a movie like The Quiet Place, you think you're going to see a horror movie. You're not quite sure. And it is, I went to see it twice in the movies, twice in the movies. Not one person was eating popcorn once the movie was started. Huh. Everybody respected the quietness of the movie, which was the whole issue of the movie. Yeah. I was happy. Yeah, that's the thing about, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but I, I don't know if you've seen Hereditary. 
Um, that's on my list. I haven't seen it. Yeah, I, I made the mistake of going in to see it on a Saturday night with a bunch of kids. And oh, yeah, that's not good. It was, yeah, it just totally ruined ruined the movie. I mean, it was yeah. just, yeah. Well, a little, little tip for horror <laughs> movies, if you like horror movies like I do, you just go on matinees. Yeah. <laughs> on school days. Yeah. Preferably. I like the school day edition. But but great. but uh, the quiet place I saw it twice and twice it was filled. I, I went in heavy. Yeah, and it. Uh, I was surprised. I was, I was starting to get mad because there was guys behind me that were commenting. They were eating popcorn loudly, and I said, uh -huh. and it was the second time I saw it with my kids. They didn't see it yet, and I was like, I hope, I hope it's. Uh -huh. And everybody just got quiet. Yeah, yeah. My I had the same experience. Yeah. So the editors are much more hands-on than like in yeah. the US. Um, and that can be a positive because they're probably mm. a little more aware of the market and the sales potential of certain calls that the artist is making when they're doing their books. However, like it's, it's more restrictive for the artist. And I don't have a problem with a hardcore editor, American yeah. editor, if he has experience. When I have a 23-year-old telling me what to do, I get really, really, really angry. I don't yeah. always show it, but I it really rubs me the wrong way. When I have a 23 year old says, Well, I learned at school. You know, he doesn't say that, but it's like, I learned what works and what doesn't work. Fuck off. <laughs> Nobody, if, if that was the case, every Spielberg movie would be a, a hit. Every uh, Ridley Scott would be a hit. You don't know shit. Now, if you have 40 years of experience or 20 years of experience, mm -hmm. in the, you might have an inkling on what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. You may, and you could still be wrong. So, you know, I, I, I do think that if you have an editor, hey, although when I met Chris Duffy, he was younger than I was. But yeah, then once in a while, you'll have this guy that will come along young and he's like just editor. So yeah. Well, and I think, it's, I think it's like that with any position on yeah, a team. Yeah. It's like you, you basically, you have some people that are going to be really yeah. excellent at their job, really do a great job. Like, and then you're also going to have who are yeah. kind of trying to hang on to their job and making bad calls. So. But you have that with uh, French editors too, uh, that say no to your book and you know damn well it's going to be good. But yeah. the advantage in France is you have so many publishers that you just go to the next one. Huh. I'm going to have to, after, after we're off, I'll, I'll have to ask you yeah. at some point about the French publications. because I, I can give you a list of the biggest great. editors and then you go down from there. I love it. I'm, I'm gonna don't, don't, I would say, uh, and this is a, a, a good counsel, I think, for everybody that wants to be a cartoonist and that wants to be a, a, a successful one. Don't start, you know, cleaning, giving coffee to the editors. Don't go like this. Everybody says you have to do the ladder. You have to get up and up and up. No, you don't. You go to the top. You get yeah. bumped down. You get bumped down, but you'll always be higher than when you started from the bottom. So no, go straight to the biggest one. I go to the biggest editor every time. Yeah. Once in a while it works. It worked for the Fool Me Dub. The, the, the book I just showed you, it's it's the biggest editor you can have for uh, humor matter, uh, humor albums. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Always go. Don't go small, you know? No, that's great advice. And, mm -hmm. and you know, like uh, a, a tip that I've heard that I, I found useful is like, you know, if, if you go to the front door and the front door is locked, try the side door. If the side mm -hmm. door is locked, mm -hmm. try the windows. Like, get in. Like, you'll find a crack. Well, my, <laughs> my best friend and writer, and we've collaborated for now 45 years probably, uh, he's, he's one like that where I would even hesitate to go as strong as he does. But man, he will annoy till he gets what he wants, and he gets what he wants. <laughs> so like, okay, <laughs> you know. That's awesome. He'll, he'll we'll be at a meeting, and and I'll be like shaking my head inside and saying he just fucked the whole thing up because the guy's getting really annoyed. And indeed, we leave, and then three days later, he gets a call, and we get a call. And we have to go back and we defend our our meet. That's awesome. Um. So that okay. So editors are different. Um. Definitely like. Di different planes, different kind of styles. Mm -hmm. That obviously is going to vary by company too. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so uh, so editing's different. The process of creating is different. Is the pitch different? Like the way you'd approach an editor in Europe, would that be a different pitch than the way you would mm -hmm. pitch to like an American editor? I find it easier to go straight to the big boss in Europe than I do in here. Here, there's like a, there's a lot of doors. 
to knock on before you get to the big boss. I got lucky two times. Yeah. Right for DC and Nickelodeon. I got lucky, I admit. Uh, but in general, it's harder. You know, If you want to meet uh, Stan Lee, it's almost impossible. In France, you, you would be French. You could go see him and have a beer with him. Yeah. That makes Here, sense. Yeah, it's, it's very different. Uh, it's like, you know, the difference there is between pop music and jazz music, where if you go to a jazz concert, you go to your favorite, uh, like I, I used to go to see Dizzy Gillespie and all those great guys, you know. And I used to go to their, like, uh, there was one drummer that I like I liked better than others that was uh, drumming for Count Basie. And I would go to him after he played, where everybody was like crazy about him, me too. I'd go up to him and say, Can I buy you a beer? And yes. And then we'd spend three hours together. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's a whole, other, in the pop, you can't go, I couldn't go like to Smashing Pumpkin straight to Billy uh, Corgan and say, Hey, have a beer. He might have said yes, because he's not a bad guy, but he's kind of weird, but he's also a nice guy. I mean, but uh, you can't get there that easily i mean i did yeah. that i did that with the bare naked ladies and stuff but it's the bare naked ladies they're very open and they're very simple uh, to, to to talk to no that uh, makes perfect sense mm -hmm. i think you're right the uh there's there's more middlemen mm -hmm. in in uh mm -hmm. in the u.s and i think there's more of a slush pile factor mm -hmm. too where it's like there really is yeah. like, just getting through gatekeepers yeah. much so here you can go to an editor and say i do lettering if you go to France and you go to an editor and you say, I do letters, he'll say, yeah, do you do coffee too, by the way? Because, you know, that doesn't help me at all. Yeah. <laughs> no one's going to let you letter. It's, you know, um, it's like Blueberry, you know, uh, Moebius, his lettering is fantastic, but it's very messy. But it's it's in the style of his drawings, you know, yeah. uh, which are, you you they're clean. But I'm, and, and I'm, I just mean that his lettering is, is coherent with his, drawing page i have an original in france my mom has it i have an original page of blueberry and it's just you could you could just you have to put a cup under to not drool on the page it's just wow. beautiful but the lettering in the balloon is part of the drawing and i like that but that's me you know yeah no that makes perfect sense mm -hmm. so okay so the approach to drawing is different the yeah. the pitch is different because the accessibility factor um, not for the promotion not for the promotion so the promotion is similar so I'll give you an example. I do I, I do a book in in Europe, uh, or or because of my reputation of SpongeBob, I get invited to Denmark. I go to do Norway to France. When I say invited, your plane is paid for, your taxis are paid for, your food is paid for, your hotel is paid for. You only have to pay for the hookers. <laughs> well, that that's not. So dissimilar from if you're a big enough artist here. No, but you're not a big. I, well, I'm 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 not that big in in Europe, but I'm I would call I, I'm I'm just known. I'm not like a big guy. Right. But they will, anybody they will invite from any country if they want to have them there, they pay for everything. Right. Well, yeah, because mm -hmm. I got I got invited to Phoenix, and I've got I mean, of course, I'm local, so I didn't have to. Mm -hmm hotel and all that stuff so yeah. um but you know my food and everything was paid yeah for yeah that. here yeah but uh i i would be uh i know that uh they pay a lot of money for the uh cinema artist and you know the, the voice yeah, actors yeah. and stuff but uh so they do that but but in europe you don't have to be such a big shot all right um i feel like a big shot when i'm there because of how they treat me mm -hmm. but then when you do a book with an editor you will have big panels you will have you know they will promote your book. Oh wow! Okay, so they—they're not stupid. They know that they spent money on your on this here, and you're going to have big panels, and you're going to have a hoopla around your thing. They're going to have TV. Uh, you're going to have TV interviews that are some of them are instigated by the publisher himself or herself. So wow. uh, promotion is a big deal. But they, like you say, it costs money to do this. Yes. Yeah. But they're going to put their wallet where their mouth is, and they're going to promote you, and they're going to invite you wherever you live. You're going to get yeah. I mean, we're not just talking about paying the restaurant, you know, or a beer here and there. We're yeah. talking about you do not spend a cent when you're there. If anything, you make money there by selling your originals. That makes a lot of sense. It's funny. Um, one of my favorite artists is uh, Craig Thompson, who did mm -hmm. like blankets and stuff. But he also did this little travel journal mm -hmm. that he published called Carnet de Voyage. And it was kind of about his like his time kind of living abroad in France for a little mm -hmm. bit while he was doing some panels and traveling there. And like the culture shock that he documents in that is amazing because oh, cool. here he's like 
huge to cartoonists and to people at conventions, but the average person on the street isn't going to be like, oh my gosh, you're Craig Thompson. Yeah. Whereas he goes to France and they have him like posing for like spreads in magazines mm -hmm. that are like not magazines about like art. They're magazines just about popular culture. And they're like, this is the cartoonist who's yeah. visiting, you know? Um, oh, yeah. And just kind of treated like a rock star in, in, in France. And it's kind of, I don't know, to me reading that was interesting because by all means, he's very successful within the U.S. Right, right, but it was right. interesting even considering that success, like somebody who had just won a bunch of Eisners and kind of reached like the top of what you can for at least indies in the U.S. And their experience in France was very much what you're documenting, which is just like, it's yeah. it's crazy how they treat, cartoon like cartoonists can actually be celebrities there. I used to be crazy. married. Uh, I'm still friends and I still talk to my ex-wife, uh, French ex-wife. Yeah. We were married 18 years, and that was one of the problems. She she would she would say it's not because because of that that we divorced, but uh, she she would complain because we couldn't eat at a restaurant without somebody bothering us. Uh, fans, it was like, well, what do I do? You know, I can't. I don't want to be like impolite with them. They do buy the books and stuff. You want to be nice, but at one point we couldn't eat at a restaurant, and I'm nothing compared to to him or to. People like Stanley, people like that. I'm I'm just a little cartoonist, even in France. But I have uh, I was on primetime TV. That's probably helped a lot. I mean, I would um, I would be on TV the next bit next day. I'd be on the subway in Paris, and then of course, all of a sudden I get all these looks, you know, and people would come up to me and say, "Can you, can you do this little drawing for me?" <laughs> so it's it's cute, especially when it's kids. Uh, but uh, it can get annoying, but it's uh, that's part of the job. If you want to make money and, and be successful, and you know, that's like those artists that are so mad at, at paparazzis, and I understand why, because paparazzis are a pain in the ass, and I understand that there's disrespect, and I understand all that. But you're becoming an artist that is that whole work is based on the fact that you're known, <laughs> that you're a public figure. No, that makes that makes perfect sense. Um, I I. I, so I occasionally will watch the like comedians and cars getting mm -hmm. coffee, the Jerry Seinfeld thing. Yeah. And there's one where he uh, had I love that show. Zach Galifianakis. Like, oh, he, I haven't seen that one yet. Yeah. Okay, it's pretty good. But Zach Galifianakis is kind of complaining about people stopping him on the streets to take yeah, photos can, and stuff yeah. like that. And Jerry Seinfeld, just basically his attitude towards it was like, well, it's fine. I mean, you got to understand, we spent so many years like on stages begging people to clap mm -hmm. and laugh at us and he's like and now we're getting it and we're complaining <laughs> like <laughs> yes the, I, see i agree with seinfeld there actually i met him once uh, in a store i didn't meet him like uh, purposely i was at a, a little chinese in chinatown as a little yeah. chinese boutique and he comes in and of course everybody looks at him i didn't ask him anything because i never asked for autographs but i was uh I was like hey jerry seinfeld. it was in the heyday of his it was the soup nazi era you know so he was really huge and um but he was so nice with everybody there you know uh, i was thinking man he must be annoyed but he didn't look annoyed even if he was i i i wouldn't have known you know um you have to be a little bit uh respectful of the people who put food on your table oh yeah mm -hmm. and they'll be annoying but they'll be annoying because they don't know how to be how can you be look if i saw um if i saw paul mccartney in a restaurant I, I, I would probably not do it, but I, the urge to say hi, even if he's eating, is terrible. I mean, you, you got to admit, I mean, I, I, I used to imitate him when I was four years old, five years old. Yeah. You know, he, he, just after he was on the Ed Sullivan show, I'm that old. Uh, but um, he's, he's, he's my, my idol. I mean, if I saw, or Peter Gabriel, even, if I saw Peter Gabriel, I would have a hard time not being impolite. Honestly. Yeah. No, yeah, you, you might not recognize McCartney because I know he goes incognito because I, yeah. I actually I was talking to a guy at a, 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 in Bisbee. I guess he visits there. But it, basically, they said if he comes in, you know, don't you know, don't acknowledge. Just enjoy it. Don't acknowledge that he's here. He'll be or else he won't come back and he'll yeah. be in disguise. So yeah. Yeah. that's why I said I, I meet with, with Peter Gabriel because I know his character because I also know Manu Ketche, his, his drummer. Uh, we worked together on a. On a movie, so um, I, I would say hi to Peter Gabriel. Well, fuck him if he's eating, um, but um, Paul McCartney, I, I probably wouldn't. 
Yeah. You know, I, I probably wouldn't because I have so much respect for him. Not that I don't respect Peter Gabriel, but it's just you, you, there's some people you don't do it. You know. Yeah, and it's like, I mean, what are you going to tell him that he hasn't heard a million times before? Yeah. You've, yeah. you've influenced yeah. me every If I see him at a store, like a Elton John, or if I see somebody yeah. in the store, I will say this. I will go by them and very discreetly say, I just want to thank you for what you do. Yeah, that's all. That's and usually they really appreciate that. Yeah. You don't ask for a fucking autograph. You don't bother them in their, their yeah. or start, but you just say thank you. I remember meeting a great uh, French actor um, in, in France that I, I loved. He made me laugh a lot and he was older and I saw him in a, like a drugstore. You know, I was in the store and I was like, holy shit. You know? And I go around the, the thing and I go discreetly beside him. I said, I just want to say thank you. For making me laugh so much for being such a great actor thank you and that was it yeah and I, I leave and as i leave he was like a little stunned and he said merci, merci. you know thank you that's awesome uh, i think i'm i'm kind of more irritating like i did this monty python group show recently and met eric idol and yeah. Um, yeah yeah and he's one of like one of my heroes like i yeah. in junior high like i memorized every monty python sketch <laughs> I used to quote it to people. Like I think it probably lost me a lot of dates. <laughs> How much I liked Monty Python. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Yeah. So I actually, so I did do the nudge, nudge, wink, wink to him when I met him because I was just like, "You're amazing, and you're one of the, like the funniest members of Python." And uh, yeah, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Not yeah. as good as a wink to apply that. Yeah. And um, he actually just. Was like saying no more, saying no more, and I'm like, all right, okay. Oh, that's cool. That's that's it. You got that's yeah. uh, that's unforgettable. One and of the last things you'll think of before closing your eyes in death, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think I met. So I, so the thing that impressed me about him was he asked me about which piece was mine, and then 15 or 20 minutes later at the show, he actually walked up to me and was like, "So your piece was the one about the funniest joke in the world, like oh, over there." Sorry. And he remembered everything I had said to him. Oh, yeah. And I was like, okay, that's probably like, I'd imagine that that's that, that kind of attitude towards yeah. your fans is, is no, you had, you had a perfect, uh, you had a perfect uh, uh, encounter there. I remember um, my dad and I, we, we used to watch mission impossible and Phelps was, of course, you know, it was our favorite actor of all times, you know, Peter Graves. And uh, one day I'm on the plane with him, and I don't talk to him, but I look and I say, holy shit, it's Peter Graves. It's Phelps, you know. And then uh, we end up at the bar together, side by side, not talking, and, and I order a beer, he orders a beer. And for the first time in my life, for my dad, that was already deep into him as MS, but I didn't tell him that. I said, look, I never asked for that, but if you could just give me one for my father, you know. And he said, yeah, sure. And then he thanked me later. He said, thank you so much for being discreet because nobody noticed him from the back. We were turning our backs. And I didn't go, hey, look, it's Peter Graves. You know? And I've seen that so many times. You didn't ask him if he'd ever seen a grown man naked? But I, I, I just said, I really admire everything you do. And my dad will be stoked. And I, I never asked for autographs, but for my dad, yes. And he, he said yes, but he thanked me later. And it was like, wow, it's a, uh, you know, but there's so many artists I, I met on trains and I never talked to them, like, you know, like Roger Moore, big fan of Roger Moore. And I was just happy to be on the same plane. And I just said, I'm not going to bother him. That's all. Um, yeah, that's awesome. But, uh, but yeah, but sometimes you, you have to because it's just, you have to. In New York, of course, you get used to seeing a lot of artists. I mean, I, I've, oh, yeah. crossed, I've crossed paths with uh, Paul Newman, with, um, with uh, uh, Kevin Bacon, which, by the way, I was surprised he was that tall. I didn't at all realize how tall he was. Um, and I would just give a nudge, you know? Yeah. They know why you nudge. Yeah. They know when you go a uh, nice smile and you go, you know, like that. They know what you're, at least you're not bothering them. You know? Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. Sightings like that are pretty common in L.A. Like, I used to go to shows when I was, you know, in my early 20s. Like I, I'd go see the Mars Volta before they were kind of big, and uh, it was like you'd go to this like Mars Volta show, and it's like Elijah Woods next to you, <laughs> like just, yeah, 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 you know. Which at the time it, it would just be like, oh, that's that guy from Radio Flyer, because it was before <laughs> uh, 
um, you know, Frodo and Lord Frodo of the Rings and all that. So, um, but it's like stuff like that where you just be like, you know, at a show and there's musicians from bands that are pretty well known just yeah. in the audience. But that's that's the thing you see with those artists. They're so uh, exposed uh, by TV and movies, they recognize them. And in 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 Europe, uh, cartoonists are like here. I mean, we don't really know the we know the top artists, but that's yeah. it. And I'm not one of those top artists, but still, you're you're treated well. Just that's to come awesome. back to that subject, that you're treated lovely. like a king. Yeah. That's cool, and that's cool to know that they promote because that's one of the things that's mm -hmm. always been baffling to me about uh, U.S. publishing companies. Like there's a, there, and that goes out like even outside of comics. It's like. Um, in kids' books, usually they'll pick like two or three books that they're really going to promote. Yeah. And then that's it. So if mm -hmm. you're one of the artists who did that like second or third book that like Simon and Schuster really wants to mm -hmm. make sell because they really believe in it, mm -hmm. that's the book where they'll fly you to stuff like that. But if you're just, yeah. you know, like you just put out a book. Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, like most of the time you're doing your own promotion, your own signing, your own. Well, signing. in Europe too, I mean, you have to help a little bit. You have to, you know, how do you call that again? When you say you pump the, uh, you know, you start, you start the pump working. How do you, there's oh, an expression. The primer, the primer, the pump. Yeah, the prime, you have to prime the pump. Uh, I was very, um, very, very uh, auto promotional. So they end up uh, when you're not known, not as known as uh, I was when I first started. Uh, I went to the biggest show on uh, on TV, and I went to see the top right away. It's like if you, it, it was the French. He's still the French Johnny Carson. Okay, so I'll give you an example. I had a book that came out, my first book in 1984, and I said I'm going to promote that on on primetime TV, the biggest show in Europe. That was Champs Elysees, it was called. And so I realized that the book was um, that book was the story, the history of the Olympic Games. And it was uh, sponsored by part by uh, Europe One, which was a radio uh, program, which the uh, the host of Champs Elysees was the also the host of uh, his own show on that radio. So I went to the radio in plain daylight. I went with my little uh, uh, portfolio and I said hi. And I didn't say, "Is it possible to meet uh, you know the Johnny Carson? His name is John uh, John Drucker." Can, uh, I didn't say, "Can I meet?" You know what I said? I said, oh, hi, I'm Vincent DePorter. You know the guy who does the album for uh, Europe One, uh, sponsored by Europe One? I just need to see, I just need to see uh, John Drucker. And, then nice. that's, and, and five minutes later, I was in his office. <laughs> and that day he said, tonight is the uh, last night, the nice show of this summer. You want to be on it? And I said, yes. I was with uh, Kirk Douglas, Michael Douglas, and uh, <laughs> Jermaine Jackson. Yeah. That's awesome. So the album sold 100, over 100,000 copies. Wow! Yeah. So cool. Yeah, Man. and I got the radio to do things. I got the the most uh, um, the biggest DJ in France at the time who had a show on TV. Uh, I met him and I said the same thing. I said, "Yeah, I'm Vincent Dupont, the guy who does this." You know, and they can't say no because they didn't want to make you make uh, look like they don't know your stuff, right? So you play on that. I played on that. I was what 23, and then uh, I got on the biggest shows on radio and everything like that. And then the oh, second wow. time, my the, my book was promoted by the publisher, of course. And I and I would still be you know doing my thing. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that makes sense. So so regardless, like you yeah. know, European or yeah, regardless. If you do a book here, us. oh yeah. If you do, if you do a, I don't understand. I understand why, but I don't understand the logic behind doing a, a personal a graphic novel and just letting the publisher publish it. No, you have to go out there. You go to CBS. You go to. Uh, uh, MSNBC or Fox News, whatever you want. You just go and get yourself promoted. But you have to do that yourself. Yeah, for sure. Because even if they do promote you, it, it'll be in Wizard Magazine. Who gives a shit about Wizard Magazine? You know? Right? I mean, nobody yeah. reads that. I mean, only only comic book. Around? <laughs> I, I don't even know if it's still yeah. around. But who gives a damn? I mean, I I remember every time I opened one, it's so complicated with all the comics. It's like, who cares? You know? I'll buy Playboy right now. You know, so it's like, no, it's not interesting, you know. So you have to do your own work. I think that's for every country. Mm -hmm. You know, like if I had a graphic novel coming out, and I might uh, do one for here, I might do one for there. But either way, I'll go to whatever country I, it's going to come out, and I'm going to put my fist in all the main programs. And mm -hmm. you'll, say, you'll be laughed at some and say no, 
like who are you but you can't act like like you're like i have a book and, and, and i and i want to promote it do you yeah. think maybe you can talk no you say hi i am joshua Campbell, and uh yeah. you you know me for my stuff you know so uh, yeah, yeah sure you sure we know you you know yeah, I, like you know, I don't give a shit. You you play the Hollywood game, right? You say, mm -hmm. uh, "I'm so and so. I did this, as you probably know. Uh, so I just need to meet uh, so and so because we have a few things that we have to talk about." That's smart. That's yeah, awesome. Just, yeah, you just have to bluff it, man. Hustle. Yeah. And if you do, like you it. have to hustle. You have to hustle. Mm -hmm. And that's in every country. Yeah, okay. and I think I think nowadays even publishers that's what they're looking for. I mean, they yeah. they already want you to have a following. Yeah, they do. So they, yeah. <laughs> part of it's like they, they want you to do the work for them, but which, that's that's fine though because yeah. at the end of the story you get the money anyways, yeah. right? If you sell uh -huh. more. So. Yeah. That that that's the bottom line. I think. So if I had to like just you know uh, summarize things, the art is a different way to approach the art. Yes, it's not that different, but there's uh -huh. a lot of difference, right? Like we talked about the um, the. The format and everything, of course, changes. But then you have the editors that uh, are different there than they are here. They're mm -hmm. more, they act more as publishers than you do as editors, which is uh, really great for the artists. But again, like I said, the, the counterpart in America has an advantage is that if an editor is a good editor, he will see things that will make your work better. Yeah. Uh, and if you're not too, you know, full of yourself, you can accept that. Um, and then when you promote, you have to act like you're full of yourself. Look at how Trump got to be president. Yeah, just be the best. It doesn't matter if you, you, you know, take credit for what's not credit. You just have to be the fucking best, right? In being a liar. Mm -hmm. Let's not I talk about that. Uh, let's not talk about him. But I'm no, just saying. Not get on that I'm just. I'm just saying that he got to where he was by oh, pure bluff. That's oh, what yeah. I'm saying. No, that's that's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm not saying that anybody, we have to be Trump. Yeah. You don't have to lie. He lies. It's a big difference. But oh, yeah. he got there because of his, you know, his bluffing. Oh, yeah. There's there's not one person, I think, who no. lived in New York who doesn't recognize what Trump is. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I was, like I said, I lived in New York for yeah. long enough to tell you that I know first persons, uh, friends, well, who he really is. And there was no talking about it. Nobody would listen anyways. Yeah. But uh, But the only thing, the only point that I want to make in relation to him is that it proves that with a lot of, you know, with some clout and a lot of bluff, you get somewhere. Yeah, no, and it, it, it actually, that actually makes a lot of sense because I, I just had to like interview people for, for where I'm an art director at, like for mm -hmm. a junior design position. And I, I can say firsthand, like that affects me too. If somebody yeah. comes into a job interview and they're really like nervous and lacking confidence and stuff like that, I. I instantly am like, are they going to get eaten alive by the other departments here? Are they going to be okay with like kind of joking around with the other staff members and stuff? Cause they seem kind of like you're lacking confidence. So yeah, like just having confidence goes a, a massive, um, you know, yeah, yeah. a massive amount forward because it makes you comfortable. Like for right, instance, right. if I'm not confident when I, when I'm talking to you, then you suddenly, Right. Like it almost puts the impetus on the people around you to like make up for the confidence that's lacking. And so and, and for people who are looking yeah. who are not cartoonists who don't mean to do cartoon who are just interested in the comic book business, I will say this. When I when I left um my, my dad had MS, my mom didn't make enough money, we were poor as hell. I mean, we were so poor, right? So at six before even finishing sixteen, I decided to look for a job. I had to, you know. What did I do? I was good in math. I went to see a land surveyor. Now, today, you need to have a diploma to even say hi to the, shake the hand of a boss, a land surveyor thing, right? I just went in and I said, can I have uh, any job here? And uh, just try me, just try me if I, if I don't, you know. And I had no knowledge of land surveying, which is a complicated math, mathematical and, you know, you have to know your, your stuff pretty well. I was so good in math, though, that I had something to sell. You see what I mean? Yeah. You do have to have something to sell. Yes. So I just overemphasized it, and I got the. I started to be, uh, uh, you know, the measuring stick guy, you know, and then slowly by surely, in two years and a half, I became uh, the chief of a, a whole. Um, I was on the theodolite doing the measurements. I was so mm -hmm. good at measurements that I had Italy, France, and Switzerland to. You know, for topography and measuring, so I, I I really went fast. I'm not trying to um, to um, 
uh, boast here. I'm just saying that with a little bit of quality of whatever you do, and with a lot of, um, you know, it, how do we say that? Hutzpah? Is that a good word? For yeah, that's good. Uh, hutzpah is, uh, that's, I think that's what comes to mind. If you have, but you do have to have something to sell. No, that makes you can't sense. go in with nothing. If somebody comes to you and they have nothing, then they have nothing. But yeah. if but if they're shy and their stuff is really good, they might get uh, hired. It, but the human uh, the human factor is so important that they might not get hired if they're really too you know like excuse me sir you know and and and, and here and, and, and do oh, this yeah. and, you know then you, you know yeah you know, yeah I, I I mean like at least in L.A. too I know that um, there's a lot of really amazing animators who will yeah. never get work yeah. at animation firms because they're jerks. And that's a that's a huge thing too, where it's like you want to be a nice yeah <clears throat> nice to work with yeah because like like at the end of the day these teams like bounce from different animation mm -hmm. companies you know all throughout Burbank and and Glendale and like that whole L A area <clears throat> none of them are gonna want to have somebody on their team who's highly talented and impossible yeah um, that, that, you, gotta the same talent, you gotta have the talent yeah. you have you to have talents. Have Good you attitude. have to be confident, but you yeah. can't be overconfident. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's this juggling act. It's crazy, yeah. And once again, I and I only take him as an example of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Trump, that's what's going to lose him is his overconfidence, and his lying, of course. That yeah. that will that will kill his his. I I don't see him going very far anymore. But I will say this: there's still a third of the Americans that are for him. So it's it works. It's, it's shocking. That it doesn't work. It, it's shocking, but it doesn't. It's work shocking that it works that. Much. Yeah, I, I'm. You know what? I thought that after Monday it was done. That was it. Yeah, no. Tra traitor to the country. That was it. You know, that's it. We're done. Uh, no, it's still. No, it's still. still it's still there. There's yeah. still a good thirty-five percent of people altogether here in America that are totally confident he's a good president. So well, it's not. It's not enough to win in two thousand twenty. Unfortunately, I, I hope not. Yeah. Um, I. I. Uh, I. To me, I think it's like the difference between doing hard sell and soft sell. Like you can yeah. be a confident salesperson and do a soft sell, and the person who buys the product feels really good about it. Right. Um, or That's you right. can be the hard salesman who pressures somebody to making a choice. And if you get a sale, it's never going to bring a return sale because never. Yeah. most of the time the person's going to be like, wait, why did I buy this? Oh, man, I bought a lemon or whatever. Yeah, you don't uh, want people to have buyer's remorse. Yeah, for sure. Just like you don't want an editor to have uh, publishing remorse. You know. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, a publisher won't have a problem with a book that doesn't sell well if he believed in it. But if he had a doubt on it and it doesn't sell well, then he will say, shit, I should have done it. And he'll have... But like you say, buyer's remorse, kind of. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, so I think so. That's that's good to know. So basically, the promotional side, regardless, like I think any country yeah. or place you're living in, if you're going to be an artist, you have to hustle. Mm -hmm. It's part of the gig. I mean, you you've got to wrangle up clients. Right. You you definitely need the skill, mm -hmm. but you also need like to be ambitious and like be out there and constantly like you know pushing your work. I wish um, I could have done that with SpongeBob, even though it was not mine. But uh, with licenses, uh, they don't let you do it. You're, you're not even allowed to be in a in a Comic Con and promote the book normally. I mean, they they'll, wow. they'll skim on it, but uh, you're not technically you're not allowed to promote your own comic books because they're not yours. They're 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 licensed. So wow. uh, there's a few things here in the states where. I would say the capitalist uh, part of uh, the comic book business is really shitty. Yeah. Really shitty, you know. Um, and I don't agree with it. I think that if you work for Scooby Doo or for any comic book, if you do the Rugrats for 10 years and you're not allowed to sell the comic books where it's almost all your work, so to promote them, it's, a, it's, it's really a shitty, shitty system. And I don't see who gets, uh, gets uh, hurt by that except for the artist himself. Yeah, I've always felt like um, even the NDA system. Yeah, like there's a lot of weird things that I feel are kind of like, like had a place maybe like pre-internet. Mm -hmm. But I but I feel like in in this day and age where things are pushing more and more towards transparency, even like the idea of signing NDAs is kind of silly because you know you can you actually have this opportunity right now. To kind of bring people on board through the beginning right, right. process, a development process, 
before something's even put out. So you can actually do a ground game earlier in marketing. But it's like, you know, I, I feel like there's some kind of backwards business. It's weird. In, it's in, weird. Yeah. See, see this, this format, right? I showed yeah. you. So, I offer to do this in French since I'm a writer also. You know, I could have written and drawn a SpongeBob book like that in a whole series of books and they never wanted to do it. I would have been really well off and they would get most of the money, so I don't see what the problem is. But no. I do like the idea of a French SpongeBob too because it, yeah. it just, um, it's, it, that is a great series to it is. be attached to. You know what I'm watching? I don't know if you have Hulu Plus. Mm -hmm. But I just realized that Hulu Plus has all three seasons of uh, of um, um, not Slapjack? No, what, no, not Slapjack. Fla is it Flapjack? Flapjack, Flapjack. Yeah. Which I think is one of the best cartoons ever. Oh, it's, it's it, so looks, good. it looks like a cartoon done by Tim Burton uh -huh. uh, on, on drugs, you know. I don't know. It's just so funny. And uh -huh. it's, it's scary almost the way the drawings are. Uh, I think the art is just mind-blowing i love it i, 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 I love yeah. i love the way the profile the, like oh, the face yeah. is just kind of like the the, <laughs> the way the faces oh, kind of yeah. switch like it's like they're consistent but yeah. they're totally inconsistent yeah. but intentionally like, like, like the dentist oh my yes. gosh the dentist he, oh, he's so scary good. i mean <clears throat> um i i think it's one of the best cartoons i was so sad when they stopped it but i didn't know they had a third season that's something i just learned hmm. so it's on hulu for anybody listening who likes uh Slapjack, go ahead. You're going to have a time. To go. I'm going to watch them tonight. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so okay, so we so we've gone through kind of differences in the art process, differences in the editorial process, a little bit of differences in the the promotion um, side of things. So uh, the one thing I was going to ask is, well, is there a difference in consumers? Like, is the market different? Like, so like mm -hmm. the the typical comic buyer in Europe. Uh, um, Particularly the areas you've been published in, um, are is is kind of the the thing they're looking for a lot different than what like a U.S. market would be looking for. I, I think so. Uh, in 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 France and Belgium, at least, um, from eight years seven years old, eight years old kids buy the books. Uh, here, it seems like comic books are bought essentially by forty year olds, thirty year olds, and then older. Uh, it seems like the comic book business is makes more money here with superheroes and older people who have been fans of superheroes, like I have, because right? I was fans of you know the Marvel and DC universe. But um, in France, you're allowed to do a comic book that's basically a children's book in comic book form. Yeah, you can do that, and it'll sell. That makes sense. I don't think it would sell here. Like my Romeo character, I don't think it would have sold here at all. It's it's interesting because I know that first second um, books is having some some success with like young adult um, oh, yeah? graphic okay. novels, yeah. um, and it's uh, one of the guys in the NCS is a kids book author, and he was talking to me and he almost had me convinced to doing. YA comics because he was talking about kind of some of the advances and stuff that he's seen going around for for like graphic novels for for young kids yeah and it it's pretty substantial but it's the middleman and the gateway like the um uh, what is it the gatekeepers like to get to those publishers it's 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 difficult so it's like that's that ties into kind of what we were talking about earlier too, where it's like, I think just the gatekeeper thing, because then you're talking yeah. about trying to approach, um, you know, like random house or something like that. Yeah. And in that case, you've got to have like a rep and all yeah. this craziness. Yeah. And um, it's, it's a weird thing. Cause like, I, I, I know people who've done that, but I've never gone that route. And I've, I've considered it. Like even the idea of getting a writer's rep for a graphic novel. So you could kind of, Mm -hmm. pitch to like the major publishers that are outside of comics that are putting out comics um because i think that might actually be something a little more s similar to what's being done in in france because i mm -hmm. think the um that to me is exciting to see that happening where you have like 
you know, major publishers like Knopf and stuff that are starting to actually put out like comments. Right. Um, I hope that continues. Um, but but once again, I don't know if the buying market, like you were saying, I don't know if there's as much of a buying market. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I, I get the impression, and this might just be me doing grass is greener, but it does seem like in Europe, people are kind of more comfortable with comics being sort of like you were talking about where, where you'd, you'd see like a horror movie that inspired you, right, so you right. could do a horror comic, or you could do see a comedy and you could do a comedy comic and you know, um, you do I'm listening to you. I'm listening to you, but can you give me one second? I have to get oh, yeah. the cat out before he piss, pisses oh, no on me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> one second. So yeah, I mean, you that seems, that seems like a big difference. I don't know. what What's your thought on that, Scott? I don't know. I'm, I've always, I mean, I've always heard that that pe people just respect cartoonists more in Europe than they do here. So sorry about that, but yeah. he will pee on my stuff. No, I understand. I have I have yeah. two dogs that'll do the same. <laughs> yeah. Like in vengeance, you know, it's like, oh, you didn't want me to come out. Okay, here you go. You like this pillow, don't you? <laughs> 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 no, it's interesting. You know, I um. It's also a, a job that's very humbling because you can go from high to, to low very fast and then high again. Um, I think I just have to be a little bit more um, assertive like I used to be. I uh, I kind of got comfortable being fed, you know, uh, work for the past 20 years. It's, it, it's, it's a tough thing. I think yeah. it's tough any industry. Like, I, I um, Scott and I have talked about this, but, like, both of us have, like, day jobs doing art. Mm -hmm. That job could go tomorrow, yeah. And it, it literally, I'd be in the position of the people who were interviewing in the last week, mm -hmm. and and possibly in the position of interviewing for like a junior position, even though I've had like so much experience, yeah. like, um, and I've seen it. I've seen friends go through it. I've been through it. Like before I even landed my position, I had mm -hmm. a year and a half where the floor just dropped out, and I had done freelance without any real drop for like 15 years and then it yeah. just dropped yeah it happened man i mean last week I, I told you two weeks ago i was ready to work for walmart because i had to make a living somehow yeah. and uh in the nick of time i've got that work from uh, my friend in france and you know the album i'm making right now is a hardcover nice album and everything but it's sponsored by um a french uh well-known um car wash Huh. So we're doing an adventure in, in Egypt and everything, a, a big epic thing, but it's sponsored by uh, by a car wash company that will uh, give it as a, a present, and it won't even be sold in stores. Uh, and yeah. I'm paid the same price as I would if I would be sold in stores. So that's pretty good. That is pretty good. That's a that's a yeah. good gig. Yeah, I, most the the bigger paying comic book jobs I've had yeah. are have been for you know. Companies and things, not oh, yeah, me just too, like yeah. in-house things or promotional, oh, yeah, you know, same, yeah. that, like AAA yeah. or that type of thing. I did the um, I did the the goldfish from Pepperidge Farm. Uh -huh. comic book. Uh, I did the uh, Muse Mix one too. Uh, those that's good money, and it's for like four or five pages, you know. Like yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so I have a new idea. I shouldn't talk about it. I'll have to talk about it in private. We'll talk about okay, it sure. we'll talk about it after. <laughs> uh, because I don't want everybody to take over my good jump, idea. Jump on your idea. Yeah, I think... Um, well, you have to have some protectionism. Oh, of course. Um, I, I think uh, it, it's it, one of the things that always deterred me about doing comics like professionally was, was the, the gigs that I'd get. I never got to like Marvel or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But the people that that would hire me to do comics, like the page rate, um, if I did like one spread for Women's Health magazine in Australia, for mm -hmm. some reason, Australia's Women's Health magazine really liked my stuff, so they'd hire me to do spreads. Right. I'd do That's one great. spread, and I'd make more than doing an eighty-page comic. Yeah, yeah. Now, like, I, why would I like? Um, just for me, like I love comics. I do comics because mm -hmm. I'm passionate about them. But I, I, I um, for just commercial, for just keeping the roof over my head stuff, like illustration's always been. It could be fun. I mean, my go to. Did I tell you about my Batman Lego cover? That's I had, so yeah, I, I, DC, the last job I got from DC, 
Uh, <laughs> he said, they said, look, we, it's a rush job. Can uh -huh. you do it? It's a rush job. And they always call me if it's a rush job because I'm the only person that will finish it, you know, in time. They said, we need it for tomorrow morning, but it's just the colors. All you have to do is the colors. It's for the layout of the new Batman Lego. There's two colors to do, two different uh, colors. I said, yeah, I can do that. That's going to be a cinch. It's going to take me less than a day. No problem. Do nice colors. They paid me $4,800 for that. Oh, nice. $4,800 for that. It was a day's work, you know, scratching your bum and you know, eating hot dogs. That is the way. That is the way to do it. I, I never get paid that much for that stuff. But that was good. So if you can do licensing stuff, that's good. Licensing um, is but um, no, I'll, I'll say my idea because it's not there's a lot of room for everybody to, to go for it. But uh, I have a good portfolio too, so that's why I, I can say it. But basically is to go to the uh, car dealerships and tell them that for Christmas, they should have a four or five pager to give to their clients. And you, you know, you make them pay the price for it. Why, why, just, why just car dealerships? Uh, oh, I'll give you an example. It's not just car dealerships. Uh, I just know by experience that car dealerships have a lot of money in their, uh, in their, yeah. um, that's why I say car. There's right. other things you can go to McDonald's, but it'll be a little bit harder. Right. Uh, it's because they're accessible. And because usually when you see them on TV, you realize that they have an ego. Oh yeah. So if you tell them, what if I caricature you and make you this and that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then you ask for the price, man. That's a fair point. And, and the, there's an advantage because car dealerships, a lot of them are franchised. Yeah. Um, and so it's yeah, like, they are. like it might be a Nissan dealer, but yeah. it's not like you have to deal with Nissan. Well, what's five, what's five to $8,000 for them? Yeah. For promotional yeah. issues. They already have the money for that. Oh yeah. Like just Way the more. junk mail that yeah. you get alone. Yeah. Car no, that, yeah. that's a perfect thought. Is like so, and you can say that also they can use it for the junk mail too. They can, instead of giving junk mail that nobody reads, Here's a comic book, man. Yeah, it's Read not it, a scratch man. off. This is actually, yeah. and exactly it's with you guys. It's an like event we do like five pages of you guys doing something fun. I think that's brilliant, and that's brilliant. and that's a good point because usually the owners do want to see themselves. Yeah, yeah. So you can do that with other uh, venues, not just uh, car dealerships. That's smart. Say that's true, but uh, car dealerships, I know by by experience, uh, they're pretty they're pretty easier to they're easier to get. That's smart, man. Yeah. That's I think that actually. And if you get one. That has different stores, then you know you can you can you can price uh, accordingly. So that's why I'm not giving a total price. I'm just saying you can go pretty far. Yeah, you should. I th I think that's actually a pretty good idea. Yeah, you can do it. I mean, you guys can do it. I mean, just go to a car dealership that you think yeah. is interesting with a good portfolio and a, and, a, and an offer. You have to have a, an idea, of course, to sell. And then once you sell the idea, uh, you can push them, nudge them a little bit. You know, that kind of thinking, I think, is. It's like I, I forget sometimes, like, and this is just my own thing, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> how hungry I was when I was first starting. Yeah. Where you, like, in order to get into doing art professionally, like commercial art, mm -hmm. it, it, it does require a weird amount of tenacity to just, yeah. like, email people you have no business emailing right. and, and bug people and cold call people you have no business cold calling or bothering. And just kind of being a little almost, it, it, at least for me, it's like I was pretty delusional when I first started in illustration. And, and I got some, some gigs from it that I probably shouldn't have gotten. I wasn't prepared for at the time. And that's how you get in. I remember that's that. How you kind of, those times, yeah. yeah. So I think that that's a huge. But you know, you go to a car dealership, you do, it's better to go face to face, to be honest yeah. with you. Because you go there and you're like, hey, look, I got this idea for you guys. Mm -hmm. and I've done this before, you know, and this is this is going to work. Um, what do you think that putting some of your uh, your advertisement, uh, you know, you, uh, put it on something that's 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 collectible? That's because yeah. you know, then they'll do it every year, especially so if, during, you, if you so don't give them winter. Much. Yeah, um, because like uh, so if you go around December. Yeah. That's a good time to pitch to a corporation because yeah. it's when they're going to approve their new budget. Right, right. So, right. is it December uh, here? Because in France, it's uh, September. Yeah, September's well, sep September's not too bad, but fall fall tends to be like the latter half of a budget for most right. businesses. Um, so that at no, that I mean in, in France, in France they start their budget in September. That's oh, okay, got it. Got so it's it. September. Yeah. So here it's December. 
Yeah, a lot of a lot of the budget planning for businesses, but find out when they do their accounting, yeah. and uh, that'll give you good good timing tips too. That's really yeah, that's true. Man, that's I like that. Huh? Great. Yeah, you go in there, but uh, what matters is that you have something to offer. Yeah, and you have the uh, tenacity and, and and not be too annoying. But I mean, being you know confident enough. Yes. And then what you have to do is deliver the best project you can give. Yep. Because that'll depend on how your reputation will go for other corporations. And also, it'll help you say, hey, next year we can do another one, right? What do you think? Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, and and that, that actually is a, a good point, too, is like mm -hmm. if you don't deliver, mm -hmm. then you, like, as we were saying before, then you've just accomplished the, the one sale, which right, is right. kind of a pointless sale. Anybody can sell something mm -hmm. um, to get that return sale. Like... To me, like yeah. Vincent, something that speaks really well of like your ability as a cartoonist is the fact that you've had a relationship with these publishers mm -hmm. that's lasted, you know, over a decade. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that speaks more, yeah. really well of like the fact that you deliver mm -hmm. because of the fact that, like, like I said, it, you know, there's a lot of people who might luck out and maybe get like one gig with Marvel or one gig with DC, mm -hmm. and that's it, you know. Yeah. Um, but to get that return. Yeah. Um, that speaks volumes about the fact that, like, hey, you probably made some money for that company. Yeah. And so they're coming back right, because right. you actually delivered. Yeah. I, miss, I miss that. I miss that a lot. I used to get, the, uh, you know, if you made, uh, it used to be if you made more than $2,500, I think, a year, you'd get a present at at, at, um, at uh, Christmas. And it was always a nice present. It wasn't a cheap thing either. It was a, a backpack or something. It, was with, it had DC on it, which was always... Uh, cool. I think I have a, one of the backpacks right here. Well, I'll, 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 it's over there. So. Well, I was, anyway. gonna, I was going to say, um, I mean, when you're going in, I mean, who doesn't know SpongeBob, even if you're yeah. you know, a car dealership or whatever? Oh, yeah. You, you say, you know, I'm artist of SpongeBob. You show them that. Exactly. Or you can even show them a sample, mm -hmm. even if it's one page of what what you're trying to pitch to them, mm -hmm. what it looks like, what it looked like finish. I mean, yeah. Well, that I have to admit, uh, SpongeBob gets me everywhere. I get to go yeah. backstage on in, in concerts and stuff. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. Because of SpongeBob and Scooby Doo. Both. Yeah. It's the best. I I I, I think that uh, that's that's a great idea. Yeah. All right. So well, uh, at least it's useful for the listeners too. They can uh, uh, you can do comic books without being, you know, doing Batman Superman, even though that might be a dream. There's a lot of um, uh, things that are uh, linked to doing Batman and Superman that are not fun either because, you know, you're not doing your own thing. So if you want to do your own thing and make more money, do do publicity, do do advertisement. That's Absolutely where the most agree. money is. Yeah, and and uh, illustration too. Like, yeah. the, the whole, the, the thing about being a professional artist is it's just literally it's it's you have to hustle regardless so you have to you have to if you don't do you got your a paid client like and you're out there and you're kind of you're hustling and you're making money doing your art or you're seeking to make money doing your art and you're trying to get better as an artist like you congratulations you're, Look, you're pretty much in the same i i will say this it'll be encouraging to a lot of people who listen uh, you know um i've seen artists that are 500 times better than I am uh, that make me tear. I, I have, I had, I can get tears in my eyes when I see art that is so nice. Right. The problem is that they're shy and they're, they, they don't, they can't sell themselves. Um, and I think I can't sell myself at times, but at least I have a big mouth and uh, I have a nudge, nudge, wink, wink kind of uh, attitude. Um, uh, so it gets me somewhere, I guess. Uh, the, the work I'm doing right now for that, uh, sponsored by that uh, car wash thing in France, uh, it's because my friend, the writer that I've been working with for 45 years at least, uh, he's like me, but he just went ahead and just went nudge nudge. <laughs> Look at what we do, you know? And uh, he did that uh, three years ago. He already has two albums with that guy. And this is going to be the third one, but drawn by me this time. That is brilliant. I mean, that's that's... Um, and and I think that's the kind of thinking you have to kind of do yeah. to, to keep keep this thing yeah profitable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know. Yeah. Bottom. I think bottom line. If you're going to the grocery store and you're getting food and it's a little heavy to carry, but you got that because of what you invented from your head and your hands, mm -hmm. you can be happy. I mean, I, at this point, of course, I'm going to be turning sixty in a few months, but. 
at this point of my life, I get as much joy to do something commercial than I am doing something of my own. And, you know, and especially if it's both, like in the case of doing something like advertising, I'm still going to be the writer and the artist of the style I want. I mean, it's really something that is only mine. Yeah. But I'm getting paid because I'm using it in an advertising way. I mean, that's so what, you know, unless you have a problem with that. I mean, you know, I, I don't know why you would. Because yeah. when you work for Batman or Superman, you're still doing something that's not yours anyways. Yeah, and I can say, uh, just as a point of fact, like mm -hmm. it, um, the NCS to me is a really great example. Like mm -hmm. the, when I walk in that room, I always feel like a nobody. Like I was surprised mm -hmm. I even got in. Um, because it's it's like literally like this guy directed a Disney movie. Like this, this guy like, you know, like ran Bongo Comics sure. for like 20 years, you know? And I'm like, who am I? But the one thing that makes me feel equally weighted with those guys is like, like first off, like everybody there takes their craft seriously. Like everybody wants to be good and is it has their work at a at a professional level. Mm -hmm. And then aside from that, everybody's doing their own personal thing. Mm -hmm. And most people, like you know, that I meet, where I'm like, you must love your job. It's the coolest thing. You're working on this cool property. Most of them are like, yeah, but I've got this side thing. Like, yeah, I, yeah I've, rarely, I've rarely met somebody who's like working on Superman who didn't create Superman that's like so jazzed about it. Mo most people are like, yeah, I love, it's fun to work on Superman, but I also have this little thing that, like, this Everybody, is what my art is, you know? I've seen great artists, uh, when I was working for DC, I saw great artists. Uh, I've been doing this job for 40 years, 40 yeah. years, 41 years this year. Um, but I w I've met people that, are known for doing Batman, are known for doing Superman, have success because of it. And all they want to do is do their own thing. Yeah. Yeah, and I've actually, I've also had the experience of like people in that position who are like, yeah, if I just had the time, I'd work on my own graphic novel, you know? Or I, I worked for Jim Henson um, just after his death, so I, I didn't meet him, but I worked with Brian and with the family, Henson family, before Disney bought it. And it was like a dream come true, right? I was I I, I could put my hand in 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 um, Miss Piggy and animate her. I was like, oh my gosh, oh my! I was starstruck oh. by some of the Muppets, right? Starstruck. I was working in the same place where they had all the uh, um, Dark Crystal characters in. Oh. So I was in heaven, right? Yeah. For about two months. And I was like, eh, this is like you know why don't why not have a card going cling you know like the Flintstones and before work. It was work. It yeah. was fun, but it wasn't exciting. It was exciting for the beginning because all my dreams come true, right? And after that, it was like every time I had an idea, I had to go through all this, you know, PR and stuff. It's yeah. like, ugh, you know, everybody fighting for their thing. And I did work on some things I loved. Like I, I did work a lot on Bear in the Big Blue House, which I thought was fantastic. That is so uh, it was beautiful. It was different. It was uh, odd even. It was fantastic. Like Shadow was like totally odd to me, but I, I thought it was a great. Uh, and I was friends with the guy who plays inside the the bear, Noel, who uh, could only play twenty minutes, by the way, at a time. But he had cameras in the eyes and everything, so he was really looking at the kids, and it, it was just fantastic. So it was really magical in a way, but in another way, I just couldn't wait to get out. Yeah, it's a weird thing. It, it, I think that's the um, because like. Like I said, I think there's a common thread between most artists I know, who, which is that they want to be making their own stuff. If you're a real <laughs> artist, yeah, you want to do your own stuff. Yeah. If you are a good craftsman, then it doesn't matter what you do. But if you're a real artist, you want to do your own stuff. Yeah. And I'm not saying that craftsman is less than an artist. I'm just saying that you can be a craftsman, craftsman, and love your work and everything, but you're not so liberally in your own mind. You're not liberal in your own mind. You can you can follow a boss. I can't. They always make me shit at one point. Always, yeah, except I, for some, and I will name them because they're worth naming. It's Chris Duffy for Nickelodeon and uh, David Irwin for DC. Those two people, I would I would I would uh, sell myself as a slave for because they're so great, so great. It was a pleasure awesome. every second to work with them. They are the best people. Now, David Rowan is uh, taking care of um, the Transformers. And Chris Duffy is still on SpongeBob. 
And I don't know how, what the future will hold for the comic book. We'll see. But I, I have no doubt we'll work again together again. Yeah, that's amazing. And and that's a cool thing that you found um, bosses that are worth working for. Yeah. You know? um, I think yeah, that's... I, I remember going coming from France, right, where you're the artist, and then you go see the editor, and the editor supposedly doesn't know how to draw, right? I remember going at David Irwin, and I would do a Batman and everything, and he said, no, you should do it like this. And he draws it. Like, it looks like Bruce Jim did it. You know, it's like, what? You know, what the frick? What, what, what's going on here? <laughs> you didn't ask me to do it. You do it better. But no, he's the editor, right? So yeah. he, he does editing. But the guy has an understanding mm -hmm. of art that is just absolutely amazing. And it makes you think, wow, I can't pretend with him. I got to do the real stuff. And I think we mutually respect each other very, very much. Actually, I, I love him. I think he's a great guy. That is I feel awesome. like we're family, you know. And in fact, I, I, I have, you know, slept at his house when I come to New York, when I live upstate. So, yeah, so you become friends with those people uh, that are really uh, precious in, in this. in this. But they're, they're rare to be that good, you know. Yeah, no, that's, that's they're amazing. Good ones. They're good editors. I, I, in fact, every editor I met in DC Comics I liked, they were all good. You know? That's cool. Cool. Um, oh, man. Uh so have we missed anything like i feel like have we missed any any kind of fundamental things about european versus american comics i feel like we kind of overviewed it pretty well yeah no i think we did i think we did a great overview the yeah. overview 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 uh because over there it's european and over here it's your pooping <laughs> i love it <laughs> um right now it is Right so, now, it's, you're 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 uh, you're a Putin. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, that's that's a good that's a good that's a good spot. Um, so okay, I think maybe before we close out, why don't we all kind of recommend a uh, a European comic um, for for our listeners to read? I'm gonna go with a weird one, and I'm not sure um, it, it, if this is originally. French. I know it was originally published in French, but I think it's actually a Canadian comic. It's called Paul Moves Out, and oh, yeah, it's all yeah. there's a whole series of these Paul stories, and they're really cool. um, a lot of good Canadian out. artists, by the way. What's up? A lot of Canadian artists that are amazing. Oh yeah, yeah, and I, I think Drawn and Quarterly is up like yeah. based out of France, um, and they put out a lot of really beautiful books. Yeah. But but that's one I would recommend. It's got like a line style that's really um, kind of like. Uh, like Warhol's illustrations pre Warhol doing mm -hmm. crazy prints, but like when he when he used to do those like ink blot illustrations, yeah, with, uh, mm -hmm. of shoes. It's it's kind of like that. Um, really nice, just beautiful line work and, and fun stories. Um, Scott, you were just holding up that book. What was that? Yeah, I'm gonna. That's what I'm gonna recommend is uh, Three Shadows by Cyril yeah. Pedrosa, mm -hmm. and I mean, just it's. The cartooning is amazing. The story is amazing. It's a very sad story. It deals with loss and everything, but it's it's so beautifully done. I, have to buy it. I, I, I saw it. Oh, that's, it is beautiful. Yeah, I saw just, it. The story. Oh, it is beautiful. Yeah, and it's put out by First Second. It's originally it was originally. I'm pretty sure it was published in French, but it's you know this is English First Second. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's. It's a beautiful I'll have book. To get that one. I'll have to get yeah, it's um, it's amazing. He's just incredible. But yeah, I have uh, you know, as you know, you guys, I love Tintin for its storytelling and its uh, Art Deco kind of style. But I will, um, I will uh, rather um, advise people to to read an asterisk. They're also in English. You can find them in good stores. Uh, the line work, uh, the the paintbrush work, is absolutely fantastic. It's very has a lot of velocity. A little bit like your book there. So it has this velocity. I'm trying to get back to that. I started losing a little bit that. And in the new comic book I'm doing, I'm doing a little bit more velocity. And yeah. I love it. Um, and, and that's actually a good reminder um, for me, too. Like, I, I feel like um, anytime I, I, I will get so lost in cartooning sometimes that I, I will actually forget to check out other cartoonists. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's such a good thing because like when you see a, a, an excellent, like a master cartoonist, <clears throat> like look at Asterix and um, oh, yeah. 
when you look at the art on that, it's like you're going to get something from that that will affect your own work right. in a really positive way. The new uh, ones are okay, but they're not drawn by him, so try to get the older series. Yeah. So in our chats, there's a few people uh, who've said some pretty interesting things that I want to oh, mention yeah. before we before we go. So uh, one is uh, Keeman, um, who's also a cartoonist. She said, uh, I got a feeling that European comics are leading American comics, and I would agree. I think Europe's been kind of um, at the forefront of kind of creating, like treating comics as more mm -hmm. literature and, and taking it more like their books and its art. Um, and I think that, that the, the, book, mm -hmm. the publishing industry here is, is slowly starting to kind of catch up with that. Uh, yeah, I think it's because of the movies. Uh, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I mean, you know, movies uh, are great. Um, I, I, I will answer this. I am totally disappointed by the American reception of um, what I thought was a, a masterpiece, and that was Valerian. I thought it was a masterpiece. You might not think so. No, I just watched but, that. Yeah, Valerian for me was like the perfect, because I used to read Valerian when I was a kid. And especially my favorite book was The, 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 the Thousand Worlds, you know. the. Um, and so I saw it in 3D in the theater. My, my jaw was dropped all through the whole thing. And I laughed a lot because it was funny. Uh, it wasn't as funny maybe as um, The Fifth Element by Besson, but it was uh, just as beautiful. And I was uh, I, I I was very disappointed, but in France, of course, in Europe, it did. It was crazy good. You know, it worked really well. So I bought the DVD. Uh, I mean, the Blu-ray. But uh, it just goes to show that uh, you can only sell American comics in American theaters. It's not going to work if you're going to do the French. Yeah, one. and I don't. I mean, I, I, what did you think of uh, what did you think of Tintin? I, I mean, I thought that I movie was great. I thought it was great. I, I honestly. When I knew Spielberg was going to do it, I was like, okay, that's going to be fine. Yeah. Whatever he'll do, it'll be fine. And then he decided to do it in CGI, and I thought it was great. I yeah. loved it. But I, I don't, I mean, I think it did all right here, but not like. No, it didn't do it was great. But it was, it was really, you know, I'm a Tintin fanatic, right, since I'm born. So uh, I could only have been disappointed. I mean, but I wasn't. I thought it was a very good, uh, it, it was a good mashup of what, uh, what Tintin really is and how Captain Ad Haddock is. I thought a lot of the uh, moments that I was so enthralled with as a kid were on, on the screen. It was well done. Um, I think it was a smart idea to do CGI because it would have been hard to do it. There are French movies with real actors, but they're in the, they're in the um, French culture. So if you would watch them today as an American, you might think they're the worst movies ever made. Um, but um, as a kid, of course, in Europe, you saw them and you were like, Tintin. Uh, the cartoons are usually pretty good. I know the animator who did that. Um, they're usually pretty good, but I thought the, that the Spielberg's version was, it was great. I mean, yeah, I, I just, I thought the, uh, was great. basically the, the, the cinematography of that yeah. movie. And just, it, it was like, great. The, I mean, yeah. yeah. Look, for, for a fan of Tintin, I, I doubt that fans of Tintin did not feel they were in a Tintin movie. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that CG choice is really good. I, I actually, I, I'm going to say something that might be a little weird, but I actually liked the, the recent Peanuts movie. Yeah, yeah I, I, like that, I like that too. Yeah. Yeah, I was blown yeah, away sorry. by it. And, and I was happy that they decided to go the route of CG and kind of change it up, but yeah. still maintaining the heart yeah. of the characters. It looked like it's still, I didn't see it yet. I want to see it. I, it looked good to me. Yeah, my, my son loves it too. So that makes I, there's, me. There's movies I really hate, when, kid movies I really hate. My kids make fun of me because I don't like the chipmunks. Oh. Um, chipmunks. I don't like all those movies. And I, and I don't like the Smurfs movie because I was going to work on the Smurfs. Uh -huh. I, I knew very well Pierre Culifor, the creator of the, the, the Smurfs, and I used to go to his house and we used to laugh. And, and I was uh, that, that's when the, died. the Smurfs. That yes. Uh, yeah. So I, I didn't, I never liked the American version of the Smurfs. I didn't like the cartoon. I didn't like the first movies. Mm -hmm. And then I had to watch with the kids the new one where they, there's a whole other village of Smurfs. Did you yeah. See? Yeah. I've had I saw that and I honestly, I laughed. It yeah. looked better than the other ones because they didn't I go into like a funny. real world and I and didn't you know, see it. But. Yeah, I, I went into it thinking I was going to waste an hour and a half of my time and I was going to hate every second of it because I don't how I don't like the way they look even in CGI. But the thing was, it was a good movie though. I had to admit it. I was I was laughing. I said, this is actually pretty good. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. I 
John Oliver does one of the Smurfs' voices. So yeah, 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 yeah. It was good. It was good. I um, thought it was good. I, I yeah. I actually I would say it's way better than the. Yeah. the and I have a bias against everything Smurf by America. A real big bias. I think they're so cute by Peyo. They're so cute drawn. I was going to be one of the artists for that, and I chose to go with uh, Jean Gratton and do uh, Michael Violent, Michel Vaillant. But yeah, it was it was pretty good. I thought it was it was pretty it was worthwhile. Okay, and then uh, Adam in the chats recommended a, he's another cartoonist who watches our show a lot. Um, but he said he recommends uh, Tom Puss, the Dutch Tom Pose by Martin Tunder. So we'll, we'll have Martin Tunder, and who is the artist? Martin Tunder? Because I think I know that one. Huh. Okay. Because <laughs> well, I'm thinking maybe my friend worked on that one. I have to check it out. I'll check it out. That's awesome. Um, okay. So uh, let's wrap it. We're good. We've been going right. for, and honestly, like, it's always such a joy uh, talking to you, Vincent. We could probably talk for another, like, two hours, yeah. but, but we got to we gotta wrap it at some point. So. And I, and I do have to finish a drawing before, oh, well, I got a half an hour to do it, so. You could have done it well. well. I've been drawing this whole time. So. No, I, I can't. I, oh, I can yeah. listen to music. I've been listening to uh, grunge lately because I'm into that yeah, yeah. the concert and so. Oh, I love it, man. Yeah, love it. Uh, that's that's a good that's a good rabbit hole to go down. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, if 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 you're going down the, the the grunge rabbit hole, just make sure you throw like Dirt by Alice in Chains in that. In that oh, list. of course. I've been listening to them all the time, and Placebo too, and you know. But Placebo, it's more their first uh, records that are yep. really Agreed. good. First two. <laughs> yeah, the first, yeah, exactly, the first two. Mm -hmm. The second one being the best, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. What they do now is pretty, it's cool. It's just not. It doesn't, it lost something, yeah. If it uh, wasn't for his voice, there, there wouldn't be anything left, uh, really. Uh -huh. uh, I do like his voice. I, I do like his Alan, Alanis Morissette kind of intonations. Agreed. If, if you, especially if you listen to the second record, you're like, holy. That, that reminds me of somebody. Oh, yeah. Alanis Morissette. That, that kind of way of singing. I have to go, though, buddies. So yeah, I'm going to have to. So, okay. So uh, we're going to sign out. So um, yeah. let's just do a round and explain where everybody can find us. So you're on my channel. You know where to find me. You can just go to quarterlystories.com, which is right here somewhere. Um, but uh, to check out my graphic novel in progress. And then uh, other than that, you can check it out on the Tapas app. Um, which you can access on your smartphone and stuff like that. Vincent, uh, where can people find your work? So Facebook and Instagram, also on Twitter, but not so much my work. That's more my political side, my debate side. So it may not interest you, but uh, Instagram and Facebook. I would recommend checking out the political side and the debate side because it's fascinating and awesome. Um, as I well. can get I can get really uh, nasty. <laughs> I love it. I love not, it. not, not when it comes to um, spiritual things, but when it comes to politics, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's I don't. The, that's I'm not. Best. I'm not quiet about it. Well, that's good. It's a good time to not be quiet about it. I think so. Uh, yeah. Um, all right, Scott. Uh, you want to sign us out? Tell tell people where to find you, your work, and then how they can get on our mailing list. Yeah, you can find me at CirqueWorks Online, uh, S-E-R-K-W-O-R-K-S. You can find me at CirqueWorks on YouTube, Instagram. Um, and as far as if you want to find where these videos are, like if you're just watching Josh's channel, you may know there's, there's some missing numbers there because all those other numbers, those are over on my channel. And uh, actually, I have a playlist on there, and it will just go through Josh's videos and my videos, and you can watch it that way. But uh, if you want to know when we're going to be broadcasting, because like I said, it does switch back and forth, and sometimes it's on a different day. So if you want to know when we're going to do it, just sign up for our mailing list. There's a link in the description of this video, and that, that way you will be alerted. Usually about half hour before we go live, I'll send out a newsletter and let everyone know when it's going to be. And uh, with a link, so you can click on it and check it out. Cool. Awesome. Um, and then just to, to fill us in on the last things mentioned in the chat, so Adam Laurie said Vincent is a great guest, and Keeman said I agree Vincent is a tremendous guest on Artcasters. It was a perfect discussion tonight. And I totally agree. We're, we're super honored to have you. We'll, we're happy to have you well, back. The here. honor is mine, believe me. You know? Yeah, and we, we're going to have to hang out afterwards since we both live in the same city, yeah. and we'll try to have to get something going yes, here. Yes, we'll have to do something. That's right. Yeah. For real. All 
All right. I have a new Denny's that just uh, opened here. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, we will see you guys uh, next week. Bye. All right. See you guys. Later. <laughs>